You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. My co-host this week is Nicholas Redfern. Later on in the show, we'll hear from Mark Pilkington. He's written a new book, a hardcover book, believe it or not, called Mirage Men, subtitled An Adventure into Paranoia, Espionage, Psychological Warfare, and UFOs. And we have to check whether it's in that order or some other order. I'm Gene Steinberg. This is the Paracast. Nick, you've written so many books, maybe not as many as I have, but you've written a lot of books. How do you go about researching a new book? Do you get suggestions from your publishers as to a new title or what? No, it's never really through the publisher. It's just basically, you know, me doing research and then finding something that potentially looks like it could be an interesting story and then approaching a publisher to see if they are interested. It's usually that simple. It's very, very rarely that, you know, a publisher will say, can you do a book on this? You know, they'll, they'll certainly invite you to suggest ideas to them, but it's it's very rarely in my experience, at least, that it's the other way around. We've had a thread open over at the Paracast forums at forum.theparacast.com, and it was started by our friend Chris O'Brien. He's trying to get you in trouble here. And it's all about this new book you have that we'll be talking mm. about in more detail in the next couple of weeks called Final Events. How did mm. that idea come to you? Well, actually, one sort of idea came to me a number of years ago, about four years ago. I interviewed an Anglican priest from Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, named Ray Boche. Ray may not be known to too many people in ufology today, but he's a former state director of MUFON for Nebraska. And he was particularly heavily involved in the 1980s in trying to use his senator to push for any American materials that might exist on the Rendlesham Forest case to be declassified into the public domain. And so Ray, you know, was at the forefront of a lot of good research in the 1980s. And as an Anglican priest, he came around to the view that the whole UFO phenomenon, the, the bulk of what we perceive as a UFO phenomenon today, if you like, was not extraterrestrial, rather was literally demonic. You know, I mean, literally demonic. Um, and in 1991, Ray was visited almost like a, like a clandestine deep throat type situation by two Department of Defense scientists who said that they wanted to discuss his theories with them because they were working on some sort of clandestine DOD project that involved contacting what they described to Ray as non-human entities or NHEs as they described them with a view to trying to understand and, and harness some of their sort of, I guess what we would call paranormal powers, remote viewing, things like that with a view to using them as a weapon. And these people felt that the further they were getting into it, it was creating like a negative backlash with bad luck and deaths and ill health and all sorts of things affecting the group. And they literally went from going from the idea that it was extraterrestrial to the idea that it was some sort of negative demonic force. When I interviewed Ray about this in 2007, we dug into it very deeply to the extent that it allowed me to sort of put feelers out there and, and research the story further to where I literally was able to uncover details of this think tank type group in the government um, allied to the people that Ray had spoken to that essentially put me on the track of the book and the book is a study of this group and what we know about it and how it came to its conclusions and ideas about this whole demonic angle which as I point out in the book is a belief system you know in the same way that the extraterrestrial hypothesis is a belief system but it's it's kind of intriguing to find that there are people in government who research this angle and literally come to the conclusion that our supposed alien visitors have demonic origins and, and I do mean when I say demonic I mean literally you know burning hell demonic that sort of thing so we're talking about here the basic belief of God and the devil heaven and hell now I don't remember the name of the author I read a book about this Mm -hmm. A few years ago, there have been several suggesting that we're going to have some kind of ascension, the people who follow the way and the truth, kind of an older religious kind of philosophy. So is that what this think tank is considering, that those who follow some kind of righteous path will survive whatever's going to happen? Yeah, that's exactly what they believe. They're very deep you know, fundamentalist Christian belief system. And again, that's something I stress in the book, that many of the people in the group hold deep religious beliefs. Basically, what they kick things off for them 
was the idea and the notion that the whole UFO mystery in 47 had its beginnings in the work of people like Alistair Crowley and Jack Parsons. Crowley with, you know, invoking this grey-like being called Lamb and then Parsons with his Babylon working and supposedly opening, opening doorways and that sort of thing. And they dug deeply into all this and the whole idea that um, the contact T movement and channeling and, you know, channeled voices and that sort of thing had more to do again with the occult than it did with anything of a literal extraterrestrial nature. And they took it even further, delving into abductions and coming to the conclusion that abductions were a means by which these entities were sort of deceiving us into believing they were scientists, if you like, from beyond the stars coming here to save their race when they wanted to literally get out their clutches into our souls, I guess, in, in simplistic terms. And it's a very strange story about how this group believes. They basically believe that the Earth is a farm and that after death these entities harvest the human life force, like the soul, as a form of energy, like a food source. And they believe that the that's why they don't land on the White House lawn, but why they don't destroy us either, because they feel that the earth is like a farm, and then when on our physical death, we're literally like batteries to them that, that, that they extract from the human life force. That's It's like a very disturbing and dark story, and, and more disturbing to find that you know, the whole swathes of people in governments who have clandestinely, I guess, adhered to this theory for decades. This is very interesting, though. We've heard all these stories about government agents and about secret, <laughs> various secret projects, and maybe this is something I gather we'll be talking with Mark Pilkington about later on in this episode. But, you know, even if there is some kind of group of people who believe this, is it just some people who got a hold of some government money and they're playing a game? Can they really support this kind of stuff? Well, yeah, I mean, this is the important thing I stress in the book, is that this was like a think tank type organization that did indeed get not too much funding to start with, but when they particularly attracted certain people in government, particularly in the Bush administration and the Reagan administration, who held deep religious end times type belief systems that they got a great deal more funding but it basically is a you know like a, a semi quasi official group of people who would get together at various times and you know undertake research into these different areas prepare reports etc but the important thing is that it was a belief system based around teachings of, of the bible if you like and then applying it to the UFO phenomenon. So, you know, you could argue that these are people within governments who happen to have an interest in UFOs as well, but who all, but where it went beyond what those of us on the outside can do is that they got official funding and apparently deeply influenced certain people in the administrations. That's sort of the big difference, if you like. Well, certainly if people in the administrations were deeply influenced, that would be a question. Otherwise, you know, people would say, well, your tax dollars at work, I mean, you know, they spend money on lots of wacky things. And this is something, though, that we'll have to explore when we get a hold of the copy of the book, and Nick will come back and we'll discuss it in detail. But today... And I guess it's almost a related subject because we're dealing with all sorts of strange things that might involve espionage and psychological warfare related to UFOs. Tell us briefly about our guest. Well, our guest is Mark Pilkington, who's a, a fellow Brit who still lives in Britain. <laughs> uh, I see Mark very occasionally now and again. I think the first time I met Mark was in uh, about 1998 at a UFO conference. And most recently, I think about two years ago at Ryan Wood's um, crashed UFO conference in Las Vegas. And Mark's a freelance writer. He's written from everybody like the English Guardian newspaper, 14 Times, The Anomalies, and a whole range of other journals. Um, he wrote a book in 2007 called Far Out, 101 Strange Tales from Science's Outer Edge. And he also runs a website called Strange Att Attractor, where you can find all sorts of uh, interesting, unusual anomalies and 14 tales, etc. And Mark's got a new book out now, as you said, Mirage Men, an adventure into paranoia, espionage, psychological warfare, and UFOs. Coming this up is... next on... The Paracast. Yeah. 
Hey neighbors, ever thought about creating a website? With HostGator, you can create your own website with your very own .com domain name. HostGator has a free site builder and thousands of design templates to create your website today. Whether you want to create a blog, a photo gallery, a family page, or a website for your business, HostGator has the right plan for you, starting at less than 5 bucks a month for ultra-reliable website hosting with 99.9% uptime and true 24 by 7 live support available by phone, chat, or email and based right here in the U.S. Don't be left without a website. It's more affordable and easier than you think. Sign up at technightowl.com slash gator, that's G-A-T-O-R, to get the lowest possible price. At HostGator, that's technightowl.com slash gator to get a special deal on all their web hosting services. On the average, Americans work between 45 to 50 years hoping to build up enough wealth to retire and live out their golden years. Unfortunately, with taxation, the rising cost of food, energy, housing, and medical, many retirees are forced to live below the poverty line. Is this a flaw free enterprise, or is our monetary unit we call the Federal Reserve Note forcing us into perpetual debt, ensuring inflation and higher taxes? These questions and more can be answered by reading G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Congressman Ron Paul states it's what every American needs to know about central bank power. A gripping adventure into the secret world of international banking cartel. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I will give a silver dollar from the early 1900s to anyone who purchases this book. Call 1-800-686-2237 and order a copy today. It's critical that the public be made aware of the system. Call and order your copy today at 1-800-686-2237. That's 1-800-686-2237. If the cost of your prescriptions are getting out of control, you want to listen carefully to this. RxDrugCard.com is a simple, innovative program designed to give individuals the same purchasing power as large HMOs and insurance companies. As a member of RxDrugCard.com, you'll enjoy savings of up to 80% on all prescription medications at over 52,000 USA pharmacies, including Walmart, Walgreens, and Eckert's. Don't risk ruining your health by using cheap, counterfeit foreign drugs. This program provides savings on safe, genuine, FDA-approved medications with low membership fees, unlimited use, no age or income requirements, and coverage for all pre-existing conditions. RxDrugCard.com is an absolute must for anyone who pays for their own prescriptions. Enroll today for as little as $4.50 per month at www.rxdrugcard.com and start saving immediately. RxDrugcard.com is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. Visit rxdrugcard.com or call 888-216-2461. That's 888-216-2461. Less is more. I want you to think of Life Change T as, well, a 2008 Ferrari 612. The Ferrari 612 is a two door, four passenger luxury car that gives an exploding 540 horsepower through its six liter V12. It has a top speed of 199 miles per hour and can accelerate zero to 60 in about four seconds. Life Change T will accelerate your life into feeling more energy, losing weight, and cleansing toxins out of your body so you'll live longer. And guess what? You can accelerate your life without a Ferrari 612 sticker price of $318,000. You can buy green tea for less, but unfortunately, it's just another daily driver with no performance. So for just about a dollar a day, you can drive the Ferrari of teas. Don't be fooled by size. Check our website out at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. Or you can call us at 928-308-0408. Again, that's 928-308-0408. Remember Life Change Tea. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Get in on all the action at forum.theparacast.com. We have Mark Pilkington joining us. He has a new book out called Mirage Men, an adventure into paranoia, espionage, psychological warfare, and UFOs. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Our co-host this week is Nick Richtfern. Mark, welcome to the Paracast. We're talking to you from your home in the U.K. where it's raining. 
It is raining, drizzling, I'd say. It's a typical early autumn evening here in grey, muggy London. Okay, so in grey, muddy London, how did you get sucked into investigating paranormal events? In in the uh, American Midwest, yeah. Um, well, I've been I've been fascinated with I guess the Fortean and anomalous phenomena since I was a kid, really. And I always like to say when everyone else was reading uh, the famous Five and Enid Blyton, which actually I wonder if American listeners are familiar with. I was when at, at the age of seven and eight I was reading sort of H.G. Wells and Dracula and things like that. So then uh, I sort of began to uh, realize that some people uh, thought these things were real, not just fiction, and I discovered Fortean Times magazine at, at an early age and so sort of got sucked into that and ended up about 15 years later working for them, which was, a gr- which was great, and I sort of wrote a, a sort of short uh, investigative piece every issue for them for several years and eventually uh, sort of decided to go it alone, and, and uh, here I am with, with uh, my first book out. It's very exciting. Now, in choosing to write Mirage Men among all the topics that one can choose, why did you pick this one? Um, because I've I've been I I really think that UFOs are kind of the the most important and most immediately accessible and dominant kind of uh, flavor of of anomalous encounter and experience that people are likely to have and to uh, to hear about or to read about in our modern technological uh, world and I actually really think that they're, they're an important part of of, uh, of, of, of our culture. I mean, uh, they, rep- they still represent, I believe, a fascinating scientific puzzle and uh, they're a sort of, you know, nodal point or a magnet for a wide range of, of scientific anomalies from natural phenomena like atmospheric and astronomical events to, you know, perhaps uh, true paranormal phenomena, extra-dimensional physics, or, you know, uh, incursions into our space-time by something else entirely. I, I think, you know, they're, they are really worthy of study. Now, the title Mirage Men, that seems to connote some kind of semi-realistic nature to this, the fact that they're not always what you think they are, mirages, that they might not even be always real. Yes, I mean, there's obviously a, a, there's a uh, connotation of illusion and uh, delusion in, in the title, and also, obviously, I'm sort of referencing uh, the fact that the American desert and the Midwest play such a central role in, in sort of the development of, of the UFO story. But, yes, I mean, as well, I, th- I think um, nobody would now, sort of 60-plus years down the line, nobody would disagree that the great majority of uh, UFO experiences are the result of misperceptions or, or um, misperceptions of some kind or just sort of uh, accidental um, mis- misidentifications of, of mundane objects or, and this is what the book's about, on very rare occasions, genuine uh, deceptions. Well, that's an interesting thing about deceptions, you know. The other implication I got from hearing the title Mirage Men, I thought, you know what? The three men in black. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so are we looking into men in black as part of this overall picture? Uh, it's interesting. I mean, the men in black is something I would have spent more time on if, uh, if I, I really had to keep the book kind of to a reasonable length. But uh, the men in black certainly come into it. And one thing uh, I found when sort of going through the historical material is that uh, contact officers of the different sort of intelligence and military uh, kind of uh, organizations would habitually, it seems, uh, actually dress up as people from another organization in order to conduct their investigations and research. And I would imagine occasionally they might just you know, put on uh, dark suits in order to, to appear imposing and, and even threatening. Uh, so is this kind of like a military turf war where the Air Force doesn't want to step on the Navy or the NCIS doesn't want to step on the Army? Is it one of those turf wars where they do this because they don't want to get involved in that kind of thing? Yeah, I think I think to a certain extent. And also, I think perhaps if they don't want to be identified as one you know, as one uh, organization or another. But I think it was sort of, it was kind of, it was normal for certainly CIA and NSA um, contact officers to dress in civilian clothing. So 
I would imagine they would dress in, you know, would, if if they were involved in these kinds of uh, contacts, then I think they would, you know, they would dress up, look look sharp. Um, but I think another important, um, I think another important part that we shouldn't underestimate in this is the ufologists themselves. And there's, I think, very little doubt that a certain uh, sort of prank-prone um, members of the UFO community might well, at times, particularly I think in the 60s, have dressed up to uh, play tricks on each other and sort of perform stunts. And I think particularly of people like uh, the late John Keel and uh, Gray Barker and and I think uh, James Mosley, of course, may I suspect on, on some occasions they have been somehow at least involved in men in black uh, escapades. Well, we and know that Mosley and Barker were certainly involved in escapades because Jim has basically confessed some of those escapades on this show. Oh, great. I, I haven't heard that particular episode, but I would like to. But yes, I, I've, I've read accounts of them doing this. And, of course, um, you know, Gray Barker more or less it, it invented the, the sort of concept of the men in black, which, I mean, one possibility I think is interesting to consider maybe after... Barker had kind, you know, had created this concept. Maybe some in the intelligence or military spheres thought, "Oh well, here's something we can play with. Here's another another identity or another costume for us to uh, adopt." So I basically, you have the fiction story. of the Men in Black, created yeah. by Gray Barker, maybe extrapolating what happened to Albert K. Bender many years ago, mm-hmm. and then you have the authorities looking at that and say, "Hey, we can do that too. Let's have some fun with it." Yes, I think that's certainly the case, and I, I think that's quite likely to be the case, but I also certainly think that kind of circularity is, is a large part of how the UFO phenomenon has kind of developed and accrued uh, this sort of rich mythology around it, I think, and it works both ways. You know, the military and, and intelligence authorities will play on things that emerge from the UFO community, and we see that much later on in the 80s with uh, the Paul Benowitz story and um, and I think it, I'm sure it works the opposite way around where uh, the UFO community might adopt uh, ideas picked up from, from the military community and obviously there's some traffic of there's human traffic between all those spheres and that a lot of uh, UFO investigators and researchers have been uh, in the military or intelligence services at some time themselves. And maybe civilians are being sucked into things they shouldn't get sucked into. I want to ask you about the Benowitz case for people who are new to the show and haven't heard about that. In our next segment, we have Mark Pilkington. He's author of Mirage Men. The co-host is Nicholas Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in The Paracast. Okay, neighbors, here's the problem. Face-to-face business meetings with clients and colleagues are always going to be important. But business travel is a hassle, and it's often a complete waste of money. Well, here's a solution for you. Do more, travel less with GoToMeeting. GoToMeeting is an award-winning online meeting service brought to you by Citrix. With just a click, host sales presentations, training sessions, or product demos right from your own desk. Avoid the hassle of traveling and still exceed your sales goals. Plus, GoToMeeting is just $49 a month for unlimited online meetings. Plus, voice over IP and phone conferencing is included. My listeners can try GoToMeeting free for 45 days. For this special offer, visit GoToMeeting.com slash podcast. Once again, GoToMeeting free for 45 days. Visit GoToMeeting.com slash podcast podcast. Where have all the military surplus stores gone? Don't worry, you don't need one. Because everything you need at Military Surplus is at MainMilitary.com. That's M-A-I-N-E Military.com, one of the last surviving true military surplus stores in the country. Go online now to MainMilitary.com and discover a source for hard-to-find surplus items at true surplus prices. Surplus gun cleaning kits as low as $2.99. Complete chemical suits as low as $11.99. See our huge selection of gas masks, filters, and accessories. Finish 
Wretched M10 gas masks are three for thirty dollars, and Swiss filters are three for twelve dollars. Searching for Strike Anywhere matches? MainMilitary.com has them. Plus a whole new product line of survival and first aid kits, and lots more. Get free shipping on orders over fifty dollars only at MainMilitary.com. That's M-A-I-N-E Military.com, or call eight seven seven six zero eight zero one seven nine eight seven seven six zero eight zero one seven nine. MainMilitary.com, the main name in military supply. If you've used the drug Reglan or its generic form, metoclopramide, please listen carefully. Reglan has been shown to cause serious neurological side effects, consisting of involuntary movements of the face, limbs, and other body parts. If you or a loved one has suffered this condition, call the New York and New Jersey law from Avashman and Mirasola at 888-730-DRUG. That's 888-730-DRUG for a free consultation. Call 888-730-DRUG. That's 888-730-3784. If you've taken the contraceptive Yaz or Yasmin, please listen carefully. These drugs have been found to cause blood clots in the body and gallbladder disease. If you or a loved one has suffered these side effects, contact the New York and New Jersey firm of Oshman and Mirasola at 888-730-DRUG immediately for free consultation. Call 888-730-DRUG. That's 888-730-3784. Again, call Oshman and Mirasola at 888-730-3784. Hi, this is Alex Jones. Remember when I said you spell freedom, F-O-O-D? It's really true. Legislation is in the process of restricting the growing and sharing of food. And a record number of Americans, over 43 million, depend on the government to feed themselves. Food prices are going up for Americans. Prices are going up, even for eFoodsDirect.com. This will require their first price increase in three years. The most important thing Americans can do for their own freedom and survival in these hardest of times is to get supplies of high-quality storable food. Because of the huge response to this buy three and get one free special, eFoodsDirect.com will continue this special until September 27th. Right now, you can buy three and get one free at the old prices. But move fast, because this offer ends September 27th. Call 1-800-409-5633 or on the web at eFoodsDirect.com forward slash Alex. That's 800-409-5633 or on the web at eFoodsDirect.com forward slash Alex. Tired of searching for great talk radio? And I think it really does make a difference. We are the GCN Radio Network. You're in the Paracast. You never know what's going to happen next. We're we're talking with Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Men. Our co-host is Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. We're in the Paracast with another segment with Mark. And I wanted to ask you, one of the classic attempts at harassment and disinformation is Paul Benowitz. Can you refresh the memory of our listeners about this case? Yes, certainly. Um, and the, the, the Benowitz story is the best known and probably the sort of only genuinely accepted uh, instance of of, uh, of a Air Force uh, deception program sort of being uncovered and exposed, and that was actually done back in 1989 by William Moore, the UFO researcher and author of uh, the Roswell incident, who actually was himself kind of wrapped up in the, uh, in the program. And Paul Venowitz was a physicist and engineer uh, running his own lab, Thunder Scientific, on the uh, edge of Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, where he was developing uh, tools and uh, gauges and equipment for all of the, well, certainly for the Air Force and the Navy, I think for NASA as well. And um, there are kind of various paths that you can take with the story, but the sort of bare facts are that he, in uh, 1980, began filming and, and observing uh, strange lights are flying uh, within a uh, clear ice, ice shot of his own home at the side of the base and uh, also began picking up um, radio or electromagnetic emissions which he connected to these lights and uh, dutifully reported to the security uh, personnel at Kirtland as as would, would be the, the right thing to do. And um, instead of either saying... Uh, thanks for letting us know, Paul. But you know, don't worry; these are our own craft. Don't uh, you know? Don't don't worry about it. And, and just, we'd rather you didn't uh, 
keep filming them or keep talking about them. Instead, they actually uh, encouraged Benowitz in, uh, in to continue sort of monitoring these uh, the lights and the emissions, and actually uh, encouraged him in his growing belief and and uh, delusion that these were extraterrestrial in nature, and this continued for. Uh, actually for several years and then um, ultimately sort of grew out of hand um, to the extent that uh, Benowitz was hospitalized for his own good uh, by his family in a mental institution for a month and really uh, sort of his, his life, his family life, his business and I think you know, everything suffered as a result. It's a very complicated story which I sort of tell in the book and is also very well told in Greg Bishop's uh, Project Beta book, which um, is, is also available. But um, one point where sort of the, the version of events that I sort of followed uh, differs from from Greg's is um, very early on. It's quite clear that Benowitz could have been stopped dead in his tracks by uh, Air Force intelligence or by the by the military um, by uh, and they could have actually forced him to stop uh, listening in on on their transmissions and to stop filming, but they chose not to, which begs the question why, and I, I uh, suggest following uh, Brad Sparks and Barry Greenwood's own uh, research, I suggest that uh, really the, the idea was to use Benowitz as a mouthpiece to spread disinformation into the UFO community, which he did extremely successfully through, uh, through multiple channels and through multiple individuals, and these uh, ideas that he kind of um, pumped into the UFO culture are still with us today, and you know, including um, the idea of an underground alien base at Dulce, New Mexico, uh, in, in sort of trade agreements between uh, negotiations and agreements between the U.S. government and the extraterrestrials, and and also the sort of malevolent, uh, hungry nature of of the extraterrestrials themselves. All, a lot of these ideas. Were kind of uh, took were, were developed in in uh, Benowitz's already uh, sort of disturbed mind, and, and then led to a, a kind of dramatic upsurgence of interest in the UFO story and in the popular culture in the sort of late 80s and early 90s. Most of it uh, predicated around this kind of negative and, and slightly, uh, well, actually quite terrifying uh, idea that that the extraterrestrials were malevolent and we were just about holding them at bay. Also, is this also responsible for the stories in connection with UFO abductions that the aliens might be trying to create a race of hybrids? Is that part of yes. this deception? Yes. That, um, well, that was certainly something that um, uh, Benowitz kind of uh, uh, developed. That was one of the lines he developed. Uh, but that was also kind of circulating in the, in the culture of time. But he uh, conducted hypnotic uh, sessions with a woman called Myrna Hansen who uh, described sort of terrifying uh, scenes in an underground alien in, uh, in, in an underground alien base involving sort of human body parts bubbling away in vats and mutilated cows being carried into the air, into the uh, into the uh, environment for experimentation and and also the idea that she'd been uh, implanted by the aliens to uh, in order to control her thoughts and actions and, and sort of make her um, traceable at any point by the extraterrestrials. All of these ideas were, were sort of, uh, if not originated by Benowitz, but were, were certainly uh, uh, exacerbated by him and, and sort of pumped with much gusto into the UFO uh, culture. Well, of course, one example of someone who follows this sort of thing is a UFO abduction researcher, Dr. David Jacobs, who's also been on the show. He's basically a doctor in history, but he's been doing abduction research, and he believes apparently in this hybrid thing. Is he also being taken in by this? That, that's, a, I mean, that's a very, very <laughs> complicated and long story. I actually saw Jacobs give one, I think, his first ever presentation in the UK in the mid-'90s, and it uh, worried me, but absolutely terrified my friend who couldn't sleep at night afterwards um but um i think yes i mean i think uh, that, you know there are several people who have uh, been uh kind of 
I suppose, sort of mutually encouraging each other in developing the uh, sort of alien abduction narrative. There's obviously uh, Bud Hopkins as well as Paul Benowitz and and uh, David Jacobs, and it's reached a point where the sort of story has become that. Uh, yes, there's a sort of hybrid breeding program in order to, I don't know whether it's to repopulate a, an alien planet or to take over our own, I'm not sure. But, you know, you can sort of see the evolution of this narrative, and it's, and it's a frightening narrative um, over the course of uh, 20 or 30 years. And so the question I would ask is, you know, if we think back to uh, the late 80s and through to the mid-90s when the abduction uh, scenario was really part of the popular culture, and you would see uh, the grey alien faces and the schwa stickers and uh, and um, you know inflatable dolls almost everywhere you look. Particularly if you were in America, as I was at the time, you have to wonder where they've all gone now. Perhaps the um, aliens realised they were getting too uh, too much exposure and decided to go. Or, or they got enough of our sperm and enough of our babies or fetuses and they decided to do something somewhere else. Yeah, of course, that's that's a possibility. But, um, I mean, I would re- personally, I would read the abduction uh, abduction scenarios of, as a as a uh, as a, um, as, a, as a as a as a myth or as a, a law that has sort of developed and probably tell, tells us more about ourselves than it does about uh, extraterrestrials. We'll have Nick Redfern join in on the questioning in a moment. We have Mark Pilkington. He's author of Mirage Men, subtitled An Adventure into Paranoia, Espionage, Psychological Warfare, and UFOs. And evidently, some of that psychological warfare may involve UFO abductions. A reminder, if you have comments about the show, you, of course, can write us, but you can also check out our forums at forum.theparacast.com. That's forum.theparacast.com. It's free to sign up, free to get involved, and the discussions can become rather fierce, rather hot and heavy, but they're nevertheless fun. Our co-host is Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in. Where are we? Oh, we're in the Paracast. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. Question, what would you rather drink, acidic water which burns holes in your body and causes loss of bone mass, or alkaline water which promotes high energy and vibrant health? The answer is clear. And if you're drinking acidic water, you're helping cancer cells and bacteria to grow out of control. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops combine a unique formula of the most alkaline minerals. Using Plasma pH Drops is the best way to alkalize your water and help you get rid of acid and regain your health and energy. Simply put 10 drops in the water you drink to raise the pH to a healthy alkaline level. Most experts agree that the water you drink should be at a pH level of 8 or higher. Disease organisms like bacteria, viruses, or cancer cannot survive in an alkaline high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops now by going directly to AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A-Vision.com. Or by calling 269-409-1776. Again, 269-409-1776. Do you owe the IRS money you can't pay? Then listen carefully, because you already know that the problem won't go away by itself. You can get help today from the leading tax expert in the country, Dan Pilla. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. The IRS isn't going to just forget about you. Right now, the IRS is hiring thousands of tax collectors to go after delinquent accounts just like yours. That's why you need to take action today, and I can help. 
I take a simple but proven approach to solving your tax debt problem. First, I stabilize collections so you don't have to worry about wage and bank levies. Next, I build a detailed plan to get your debt reduced to the fullest extent possible, sometimes even eliminated. Finally, I work with you every step of the way to get your problem solved once and for all. So call now for a free consultation. Call 1-800-346-6829. Dan Pilla will solve your tax problem guaranteed. He's helped thousands of people, and he can help you too. Call us today at 800-346-6829. That's 800-34-NO-TAX. Do you know someone who's a Constitution basher? Then here's the ammo you need to silence them once and for all. Introducing the crash course on the U.S. Constitution, how to argue with a liberal about constitutional issues and win every time. If you believe it's time we stop discussing left-wing lies and start telling the truth about America's Christian heritage, this crash course for patriots is for you. Start neutralizing the liberal problem. Propaganda being force-fed in our schools, the workplace, and the media. The Crash Course on the U.S. Constitution is an audio power program that includes six CDs jam-packed with amazing information, insights, and truth that will shut the mouth of any lie-loving liberal. Order your Crash Course on the U.S. Constitution online at thefoundersplan.com and look for the free bonus kit. Call today, 1-877-327-0365. That's 877-327-0365, or go Go to thefoundersplan.com. For God's honest truth, go to thefoundersplan.com today. Bringing you the best in alternative talk radio for over 10 years. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Nick Pope. You're listening to the Paracast. Nick Redfern is our co-host. Our guest is Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Men, an adventure, definitely an adventure, I'm just adding that, into paranoia, espionage, psychological warfare, and UFOs. All those things are in the book, yeah. Thank you. Gene Steinberg, you're in the Paracast. We were talking about abductions being part of the disinformation scenario. Nick, you want to continue with that, with the questioning, and pursue what you would like to? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think one of the important things, just before I get to the questions, Gene, is to to point out for the for the listeners who may not have Mark's book yet, that the book's sort of very much like a, a road trip of Mark and a friend and colleague of uh, Mark's, John Lundberg, as they travel around the U.S. investigating the whole UFO mystery and speaking to a lot of well-known figures within the UFO field and some, I guess, almost uh, near legendary figures, people like Lit- Richard Doty and literally hanging out with them for like a week. And it's sort of very good road trip feel of two guys immersing themselves in what is sort of one of the strangest phenomena out there and actually finding themselves, I guess, to some extent, at a loss from from their moorings almost, of wondering what to believe, who to believe, what not to believe, and, and who not to believe. So in, in that respect, you know, it's a it's a very good treatment of what happens when you know, an investigative journalist gets on the road and and really delves deep into the UFO mystery. And I think the good thing is that Mark's book doesn't come across as like a wide-eyed wannabe true believer, but equally it's not, as some people have actually said, like a a debunking exercise. It's more an open-minded look at the subject and and realising that there's been a great deal of manipulation of the phenomenon by the intelligence services, but not dismissing the possibility that at the heart of it, there really could be a genuine UFO mystery. Would you agree with that, Mark? Have I sort of read it right? Absolutely, yeah. That's uh, the the most uh, brilliant uh, summary I have yet heard. Thanks very much. Um, (laughs) No, I I have, you know, I could spend, uh, if I spend uh, all day uh, sort of responding to the uh, online sort of postings of people saying I'm just a, another debunker and the book, you mm. know, has nothing new to offer, I would, uh, I would, uh, you know, really have no time for anything else. And then if I had a pound for all the times that uh, people said that without actually reading the book, then uh, mm. I might be a rich man. But, mm-hmm. um, but no, I, 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 that's absolutely right. And one of the things I wanted to do was kind of uh, provide a sense of of what it actually feels like to kind of you know to become immersed in this material and and as you say to uh, sort of try and present the thought processes and the uh, emotions involved in just trying to make sense of what is an incredibly complex and and often baffling and often uh, disturbing story and um, 
you know, one of the things I've been that's been great to hear from people is that uh, they think that the book has actually sort of been helped them to sort of, you know, fight a path through the the just mountains and mountains and mountains and terabytes of of material that that's out there and, and can be incredibly uh, baffling and confusing to people who aren't already sort of well uh, versed in the subject. And um, one of the things I also have re really wanted to do with the book is to make it an outward-looking book about UFOs rather than just a sort of another UFO book that's um, sort of, uh, you know, not engaging with the, the wider world around it. Mm -hmm. So it was important for me to put the, when I was looking at the historical side of the subject, to put that into the context of what mm -hmm. was going on in the world. And I think, you know, that's, that's really very important for... Uh, for people to uh, to gain a, a sort of deeper and, and, and a wider understanding of where UFOs fit into into our world and our culture. Okay, and um, early on in the book, obviously you you get into one of the most famous and I guess almost formative cases of the modern era of ufology. That's Roswell, and mm. you know you actually you talk about quite deeply the the story of the flying saucer, the book by Bernard Newman, which actually mm -hmm. is, I don't know if you know this, it gets re-released this month. Is it? Uh, the new oh, edition of it being published, yeah. Oh, um, can you talk thing. a bit about that and how that sort of... I mean, it's a genuinely fascinating story of how it ties in with the whole Roswell saga and, and who it, Newman was, etc. It really is. And, um, and I first heard about this um, from Magonia magazine, which is a very long-running uh, British uh, UFO and folklore mag, and I must have read about it, in, I think, in the in the early 90s. But... It's a book published in 1948 and written by a man called Bernard Newman, who uh, wrote several sort of pot boiler spy thrillers, really, but he had genuinely worked in British intelligence and was actually quite well respected as, a, as, a, as an operator in that field. And I think as a result, of probably was uh, privy to a few you know, tidbits of information, certainly to ideas that were floating around. And it takes really as its premise the um, uh, a statement made uh, by the then Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden, um, and uh, one that's sort of been repeated many times, curiously by by Ronald Reagan and amongst others, and essentially uh, saying, you know, wouldn't the world uh, stop fighting, and wouldn't we all come to realise we're just one species on on our blue planet if we uh, were faced with it, some kind of threat from from outer space. Um, in fact, here's the quote. Uh, this is, this is uh, actually at a United Nations conference on the 1st of March, 1947, and uh, Anthony Eden said, sometimes I think the people of this distracted planet will never really get together until they find someone on Mars to get mad against. Um, so um, in uh, Newman's book, a kind of, secret uh, cabal of, of scientists, an international cabal of, of scientists, uh, launch a series of, of rockets and crash them around the world in different parts of the world. Um, and on, on each of these rockets is uh, encoded a sort of hieroglyphic script. And um, the script kind of pieces together the, the fact that these are from outer space and uh, that they're coming here. And actually at the end of the uh, novel, the scientists kind of fake an alien invasion with uh, people walking around in sort of strange uh, kind of costumes made out of various animal parts. But the uh, the end result is is as hoped for, which is that um, all the worlds are actually bizarrely all given their own nuclear weapons, and therefore uh, peace follows. So that sort of dates it a little bit, perhaps. Um, but the, the the parallels with um, you know what would happen. Um, well, what had happened uh, uh, the previous year in in Roswell, the idea that uh, something crashed, it was announced as a uh, initially announced as a, a flying saucer, um, are, are sort of quite strange, I would say, to say the least. And um, the, the the resonances are there, and the uh, I don't we don't know if that was the sort of uh, motivation behind the, the Roswell announcement itself, but certainly um, the, the, the parallels of can't be avoided. Um, and, and as I say, the theme of, you know, uh, a threat from outer space uniting the, the warring factions on Earth is one that 
so it comes up regularly throughout the 20th century and throughout the history of the Cold War. Um, and um, in the 1950s, actually, Leon Davidson, the um, uh, Manhattan Project scientist and uh, UFO researcher, actually took things several steps further and suggested that uh, uh, Alan Dulles of the CIA was, was actually uh, behind a kind of uh, plan to uh, to fake flying saucer landings in order to promote this kind of sort of uh, gl sense of global unity and and uh, and, and uh, sort of cosmic uh, awareness in in humankind. Now I want to mention very briefly Dr. Leon Davidson because I knew him casually. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, because he used to hang out with Jim Mosley in the old right. days, and he also released, I guess, an annotated version of. Project Blue Book Special Report 14. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's the one where a large number of very significant cases were included. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, the edition I, I uh, found amazingly at the British Library, actually, I was surprised by that, from the mid-1970s, has a kind of appendix which I found very useful called the CIA and the Sources, which collects a lot of his writing from... Uh, various UFO magazines and, and proved to be a real treasure trove of information, actually. But he was a very, very interesting character. I think it's a much uh, neglected and important figure in the early development of the UFO of the UFO story. I think if people had paid more attention to him early on, I think things would have panned out very differently for the UFO uh, for the UFO story. Well, without going into much detail, I think some of us think that the UFO field as a whole is one big, ungainly mess. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into that in more detail in our next segment. We have Mark Pilkington. He's author of Mirage Men, an adventure into paranoia, espionage, psychological warfare, and UFOs. There, folks, I remembered every word without looking at the book in front of me. It's not in front of me right now. I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at my time clock. For the show, but it's right there, and I remembered it. Our co-host is Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you own an Apple iPhone and love to listen to your favorite programs on GCN, I've got good news for you. I'm proud to announce that GCN has a brand new iPhone app available for our dedicated listeners at GCNlive.com. Listen to your favorite hard-hitting GCN programs live or on demand right on your iPhone. And the best part? The GCN iPhone app can be yours absolutely free. Download the iPhone app today by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carting to a private bank, having it led back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Nick Redfern. Joining us this week, we have Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Men. And we're discussing UFOs and disinformation because that seems to be such a big factor of what's happening in the UFO field. I'm Gene Steinberg. We're in the Paracast all together trying to figure it out, find the signal from the noise. And that's an important part here of one of our mottos for the Paracast is separating signal from noise. And a lot of this is noise. So how do we find the real UFOs from the espionage, the psychological warfare, all these crazy games? Where do we find the real stuff? That's the uh, $50 billion question. And I think, you know, one of the, really one of the purposes of all the disinformation that is pumped into the field, both, I think, by uh, the various military and intelligence organizations over the years and, and uh, perhaps unwittingly or perhaps occasionally deliberately by people within the UFO community itself is, is to create, I think, this kind of fog of, of confusion so that uh, picking the signal from the noise just becomes 
incredibly difficult. And um, one of the things I found, one of the sort of historical um, stories I found uh, that I thought related nicely to this was back in the early 50s when um, uh, radio uh, signals from uh, Russia were sort of being picked up by overflight by uh, aircraft and uh, and later by satellites, each small town would actually have sort of teams of uh, people uh, hired to kind of make noise through uh, through uh, transmitters, and so sort of they'd have what whistles and pipes and ratchets and horns and use their voices. And the idea was to uh, to sort of drown out any other signals that were being either picked up by uh, transmitters. Uh, sorry being uh, broadcast by uh, radio transmitters from uh, from Europe or by uh, or, or could be picked up by uh, receivers from the rest of Europe as well so this idea of sort of generating noise to uh, confuse a signal is, is intrinsic to uh, the role of to, to, to disinformation that's really what that's sort of what is what disinformation is that's what it's uh, but I think yes yeah, so that's uh, you know that's that's really the key. And r with the book, what I really wanted to um, what I really wanted to sort of try to do is is pick up the threads of the signal so that we can whistle away the noise and the and the distraction and you know the the, the, the fighting and the and the arguing and and the uh, uh, kind of uh, chaff and and try to kind of get down to the real phenomenon itself and, and, and try to make sense of that. And, and it's quite amazing, as, as uh, Rick Doty uh, you know, said to us when talking about um, his involvement with Paul Venowitz, you, you really don't need to do very much to create a lot of noise in the, in the UFO field. And uh, I think you know, a lot of the work that uh, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations and the Special Projects uh, teams in the 80s were doing was just you know, dropping little tidbits of data and information into the pool and seeing them team and multiply like uh, like things under a microscope to uh, misquote H.G. Wells at the beginning of H.G. Wells of, of uh, War of the Worlds. But. Okay, well, I think I'm interested in Richard Doty because we tried a couple of times early on in the history of the Powercast to get the guy on because uh -huh. it seemed like he'd have a lot of interesting stories to tell, but. Having spent time with him, is he someone who actually worked with the official sanction of the government to provide UFO disinformation, or is he, as they say, a, an independent actor? Uh, I would say my sense is that some of what he did was unquestionably uh, part of his role. Was you know he was employed to do that. Um, I think he he certainly um, was uh, tasked with. Uh, talking to people like uh, Paul Benoit certainly and Bill Moore, um, it's possible that at other times he uh, he uh, sort of drifted out of uh, out of off beam and and so sort of conducted his own uh, operations. I don't know. I can't speculate on that. I can speculate, but I can't say anything for certain. But um, certainly his work with um, Benoit and I would I would guess um, later with Linda. Malton Howe was, um, you know, was was officially sanctioned, and and uh, in the book I sort of try to trace that uh, chain of command up via his superior uh, Colonel Richard Weaver, and then up to um, uh, Barry Hennessy, who headed special projects and um, was sort of responsible for uh, the PJ to uh, PJ with special projects, and he was. One of his roles was to protect kind of new uh, technologies and new air force developments. And I think one thing that's interesting, if you uh, kind of place the timeline of the Benowitz uh, affair and and the kind of uh, real focus on pumping disinformation into the UFO community and the development of the uh, stealth program, is they're kind of they're, you know pretty close match. So I, I suspect that was really what was at, at uh, the main focus of this, uh, of this program was to mask uh, the stealth program. What about this Project Serpo episode that came more recently? Is that one of Doty's shenanigans or what? Well, um, it, we, nobody at this point, what, now five years down the line, I don't think anyone really clearly knows um, what, really, what exactly was going on with the Serpo story, which, as a friend pointed out to me, uh, recently uh, is an anagram of prose, which I thought was quite nice. 
Um, mm. But uh, certainly uh, Doty was involved at some level with um, uh, promoting the SOPO material. Um, certainly he was uh, kind of chaperoning uh, Bill Ryan to some extent at the last Lynn UFO conference in 2006 when uh, Bill was the kind of keynote speaker and, and was talking about the SOPO material and it was Bill who had kind of taken on the mantle of being the mouthpiece for Serpo um, in uh, late 2005 and early 2006. Um, and Rick was taking, certainly taking a very keen interest in, in uh, Bill and, and to what he had to say. And um, later on, the British uh, investigator and uh, a man called Stephen Broadbent, who runs the Reality Uncovered site, he actually sort of semi, semi accidentally was able to uh, demonstrate that uh, Doty had used multiple four females to promote the Serpo story, and to, each one would sort of corroborate uh, the uh, accounts of the previous one. And uh, this, while it doesn't uh, sort of prove that Rick uh, was behind it, it certainly demonstrates that he was involved with the story. I don't think that any one person, and certainly not Rick, uh, would be capable of, of sort of generating all the SOPO material by themselves in, in a short period of time. There's just mountains and mountains and uh, tens of thousands of words of material. But um, I, I think it's, it's quite um, quite possible, certainly, that uh, Rick had, had a role to play in that uh, in that story, but uh, Rick always denied it, and you know we we have to we have to we, we can't take it any further than that. I wonder if if at some point uh, we'll we'll hear the full story. But I think looking if you look at the photo material for what it is, which is you know a piece of text, then there's nothing in there that somebody who was well versed in the UFO story and UFO culture and UFO history couldn't piece together uh, for themselves. And uh, you know the the uh, Science is, is uh, apparently, I'm not an astronomer, but the astronomy was quite hokey, and uh, you know, there were certainly some, some uh, rough edges to what was put out there. I couldn't help uh, noticing that the date that the Serpo Nauts, which was the name given to the Air Force personnel who were going to be um, sent out, who were sent out to the planet Finu, um, their return date was, was actually coincided with the release of Close Encounter of the Third Kind and at, at, at the end of Close Encounter of the Third Kind, Steven Spielberg's excellent uh, sort of hymn to the UFO story. Um, okay, well, we'll get into that in the next section, okay. but maybe that's kind of an inside joke. <laughs> yes, we'll have exactly. to see. Sure. Yes. We have Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Men, An Adventure into Paranoia, Espionage, Psychological Warfare, and UFOs. <laughs> Our co-host is Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in... Say it loud, the Paracast. <laughs> Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. Good day, Jim Newcomer from Midas Resources, September 24, 2010. Gold opened this morning at 1299.70. A one ounce gold coin can be purchased for 1333.85, 666.93 for a half ounce, or 333.46 for a quarter ounce. That's 1333.85, 666.93, or 333.46. 
Again, the Congressional Budget Office sounds the alarm, warning of Greek-style U.S. debt crises. CBO is drawing a parallel between U.S. economy and the Greek economic meltdown. Debt to GDP climbing to unfamiliar territory and deficits rising to unsupportable levels. Hi, Ted Anderson. The Federal Debt and Risk of Financial Crises document the CBO has published is a must-read for every American. Covering the risks of deficit spending, aging population, and rising interest rates spells economic disaster. Call today at 800-686-2237. I'll send it free. Again, call 800-686-2237. Ask for the CBO document. Call 800-686-2237. Before you throw away your used batteries, you need to listen to this. Now, going green can save money. Go green and save money by giving life to your used batteries by charging them with the Renaissance Charger. The Renaissance Charger uses a new revolutionary battery charging technology that effectively extends the life of new batteries and gives new life to used batteries. Invented by legendary audio genius John Bedini, this unique and patented charging system rejuvenates the electrochemical plate structure in the battery without additives, increasing capacity and maintaining cell integrity. Renaissance Charge offers a full line of products made in the USA for all types and sizes of batteries. Find out why our customers tell us the Renaissance Charger is the only battery charger they will ever use. Save your money. Save the environment. Visit us online at r-charge.com. That's r-charge.com. Or call us at 208-772-4514. That's 208-772-4514. Be a part of the revolution today. As gardeners, we can all relate. What do you do with all of the excess food that you grow? Freezing or canning may have been the process you've used, but the good folks at Excalibur Dehydrator have a healthy alternative to preserve the fruits of your labor. The Excalibur Dehydrator will help you preserve your fruits and vegetables quickly and easily, so you don't have to worry about premature spoiling. You can also use your Excalibur Dehydrator year-round to make delicious jerky. And the best part? The foods you dehydrate are free from excess additives, salt, and preservatives, and that's something we can all do without. To learn more and to order your very own Excalibur Dehydrator, visit dryingone23.com and see how the Excalibur Dehydrator can help you preserve your favorite foods. Mention coupon code GCN and receive a free book on how to preserve your foods. Again, that's dryingone23.com, dryingone23.com, or call 1 800 875 4254. That's 1 800 875 4254 today. Tired of searching for great talk radio? Search no more. It's good stuff. We are the GCN Radio Network. Genesis. Genesis. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you want to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out on iTunes. We have Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Men. Nick Redfern is the co-host who says it loud. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Nick, pick up on the questioning, please. Yeah, I mean, one of the areas, Mark, that I'm was it particularly interesting that you delved into quite deeply and hopefully you can talk about the people you interviewed and your theories and conclusions was relative to cattle mutilations. Now, of course, yeah. like certain aspects of the UFO phenomenon, this has been linked as much with UFOs as it has with, you know, military tests and biological warfare. I just wondered, you know, how you kind of stand on this issue based on who you've spoken to and the kind of conclusions yeah. you've reached. John and I uh, spoke to, uh, on two occasions actually, we met Gabe Valdez, who, thanks to Greg Bishop, who, who introduced us to him. And uh, Gabe uh, was, uh, I think he was a state trooper, so I'm not so sure he was a, a state trooper around uh, Dulcie in the mid-70s, uh, and became sort of quite uh, embroiled in the uh, sort of ongoing series of, of apparent cast mutilations at that time. Um, and Gabe was, was uh, you know, absolutely convinced that uh, there was some kind of covert operation going on that involved uh, tagging cattle with ultraviolet paint, then perhaps flying over the area with some kind of aircraft. And, and to our sort of surprise, uh, Gabe described two sets of aircraft. One was helicopters and one were 
what he said were some kind of sort of strange, perhaps flying saucer style craft, uh, but that flying over the area probably with a helicopter, picking out the marked cattle and uh, hauling them probably up onto the top of the uh, Archelaita Mesa outside Dulce, New Mexico, where they had a laboratory to uh, to sort of operate on them. And um, and one of the uh, sort of interesting things when I sort of first started looking into this, I spoke to a friend of mine who worked for the UK Food Standards Agency, and I was telling him about the fact that um, the parts of the animal that were removed, so the, t- the tongue, the lip, uh, the, the uh, sexual organs, and the anus, he immediately said, oh, well, that's what you'd take out if you uh, were looking for some kind of, sort of transmission of, of uh, a virus or, or, or some kind of uh, 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 poisoning or, or, uh, or a sort of infection. And those are the parts that aren't allowed into the, the, human, the, the uh, food chain. Um, so it does sort of suggest, it suggested to me some kind of um, uh, sort of research project and and uh, certainly I'm not the only person to have said this. Um, I think a um, guy called Ted Oliphant, I remember some years ago writing about this, researching it, and more recently Colm Kelleher in a, in a really interesting book called Brain Trust, which uh, talks about uh, the possibility that this, what was being monitored was the uh, spread of prions involved in passing on what uh, uh, appears in humans as quite felt Jacob's disease, mad cow disease. Um, and another possibility is uh, that it was looking, I think another possibility is that it was looking at um, radiation seepage from a project uh, to um, uh, use uh, a, a, an atomic blast to kind of core out uh, natural gas from from the area called Project Gas Buggy from the late 60s, and, and actually this sort of backfired, and, and all it did was contaminate the groundwater in the area with radiation. And I, this is another possibility that this is what uh, the research was being was was being conducted into. Now, one thing that I'm surprised no one's really picked up on in the book, which I was quite surprised and, and so pleased to discover, was the sort of legendary uh, technological. Uh, of Bette Noire of the conspiracy world, the silent helicopter, which was always um, sort of uh, uh, fingered as being involved in council mutilation operations all over the U.S. throughout the 70s uh, and through the 80s and, and to the present day, uh, is is not a myth. is a is a real aircraft and was one that was developed in the late 60s um, and then uh, flown by the CIA on two missions in Vietnam, and it was called the Hughes 500P, and P stood for penetrator. And uh, people on the ground who heard this thing and saw it uh, flying over the heads said it was a very unnerving experience because you'd see this thing flying past, but all you would hear is the sound of an aircraft very far in the distance, and it, it was just a real kind of disjunction, a, a moment of real sort of cognitive disjunction where you could see something and you knew what you should hear but you you couldn't hear it and I was intrigued that um, Gabe Valdez described one night when he and his team were out um, sort of snooping trying to uh, see the mutilators in action they described a well-lit kind of uh, aircraft flying over their heads making a putt 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 sound and it was a, there was a sort of ring of circular lights shining down at them and that was all they could and I wondered if this was indeed one of the huge penetrators of being deployed in this area. And it's interesting, people who've tried to follow the, the paper trail for the for these helicopters, they were deployed into Vietnam, I think it was 1970, that they uh, flew two mi- missions, and one of them crashed in a sort of test flight, uh, and the other was flown back to Edwards Air Force Base in, I think, 1971 or perhaps 1972, and uh, then sort of disappeared underground, but um, it's quite possible, I would suggest, that they uh, reappeared sort of later in the 1970s, involved with whatever was going on around Dulce, New Mexico, and elsewhere as part of this very puzzling uh, cattle mutilation uh, phenomenon. But um, one thing, I, sort of a word of caution is, I would say, is that once you know stories did start spreading 
about the cattle mutilations within the ranching community, I think, you know, I would imagine that there was a lot of fear and panic, and I would guess, I, I should state, uh, that a lot of what was reported as cattle mutilations probably, you know, quite likely as vets and animal pathologists at the time said, a lot of them probably were mundane animal uh, un animal uh, attacks or predator attacks um, that in the climate of fear were kind of uh, misread as uh, as the mutilations that we now know about. Okay, well that raises a big question here, which maybe we'll start exploring also in the next section, which is the motivations behind disinformation. We want people to believe there are hybrid aliens. We want people to believe perhaps there were MJ-12 documents back in the 1980s, Dulce, New Mexico, all this stuff. To what end? Is there an end game? Why do they play these pranks? Um, I think there are multiple reasons, and the reasons change over time and and uh, are sort of dependent on the particular operation that's at hand. So I think when it's expedient to do so, they'll pull UFOs out of the dressing up box, and at other times they'll use you know uh, all sorts of of other uh, folkloric and supernatural uh, creatures, as I talk about in the book, and we can talk about that after the break. And a quick reminder, neighbors, next week on the Paracast. Nick Redfern returns as a guest to talk about his new book, Final Events. The co-host will be Chris O'Brien. But that is then. This is now. We'll look into the psychological warfare toolbox in our next yeah. segment with Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Men. The co-host is Nicholas Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the podcast. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then, a coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack! Attack! of the Rockwell. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans a galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack, Attack of the Rockoids is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Attack, Attack. Of the Rockwell, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. It's the end of summer blowout sale at HerbalHealer.com. Now take advantage of Herbal Healer Academy's incredible savings on colloidal silver. 500 parts per million, pharmaceutical grade. All sizes from two ounces to a gallon on sale. It's simply the best colloidal silver available. And CoQ10 100 milligrams with Hawthorne. An exceptional supplement for heart and arterial health is only $19. Plus get the number one arthritis supplement, glucosamine chondroitin. 60 caps for only $12. Where? HerbalHealer.com. Super Femplex and Super Maleplex, both great formulas for reproductive totification, are on sale now. 90 tabs, only $15. Need a safe and mild colon detoxifier? Herbal Healer Academy's Colon Enhancer Large 250 Capsule Bottle is now only $18. There's so much more at HerbalHealer.com, but not much time. The end of summer blowout sale ends October 13th. New customers get a free catalog with your first order. Log on and hit the summer specials now at HerbalHealer.com. There are all sorts of things on the market designed to keep you safe when you're out and about. Whistles, mace, you name it. But for real peace of mind for parents, students, and children, you need an iSafe bag. We heard a loud noise, and I could see a flashing in the backpack. The sound was different than a car alarm, so it was a different sound, so we looked to see what it was. I think it's a great idea. Introducing the iSafe bag, a backpack that looks normal until you pull the pin. The iSafe bag emits two powerful sirens and a high-intensity strobe light simultaneously to attract immediate help. Having the iSafe bag gives me a feeling of being safe because I know when I pull the alarm, people will hear it and they'll come and help me. For mobile personal security, get the iSafe bag at iSafeBags.com. That's the letter I-S-A-F-E Bags.com. iSafeBags.com. I thank God that she had that backpack and she had enough sense to use it. It's like having a bodyguard with you all the time. The iSafe bag. The bag with a built-in alarm available at isafebags.com 
You've got your gold, water filters, and storable food. Now for complete self-sufficiency, make your own fuel with Revenor.com. Don't laugh. A quality still from Revenor.com and our free book included with every still is all you need to beat the high cost of gas and stop dependence on foreign oil. Find out how easy it is to legally make your own alcohol fuel at R-E-V-E-N-O-O-R.com. Or call 503-662-4173. Revenor.com. Find quality alcohol still. Stills. Did somebody say stills? That's how Grandpappy made his own sour mash, and you can too. Revenue stills can be used to make brandies, liquors, whiskey, vodka, and more, all perfectly legal with a permit. You should check into having your own Revenue still at Revenue.com. That's R E V E N O O R.com. Or call 503 662 4173. One year warranty on all stills from Revenue.com. Fine quality alcohol stills. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. You guys are awesome. I love this station. I really do. GCN. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned in to the Paracast. Let me tell you what. You're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? We have Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Man, an adventure into paranoia, espionage, psychological warfare, and UFOs. The co-host, Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast, and we're looking at the motivations. So one reason maybe you would do this sort of thing, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, is to divert your attention from something that's really going on. So you draw attention to some kind of crazy, wacky event, fate, but they're doing something else. So is that what we're looking for, what the something else might be? Yes, I think, I think largely that's part of it. You know, it's a classic uh, stage magician's trick to uh, you know, hold his finger out in one direction. Everyone goes off to see what he's doing, and with the other, he's, I don't know, so if, um, stuffing a rabbit under a table or, or whatever it would be. But yes, yeah, so that kind of distraction certainly is part of it and if we go back to the uh, early 19 well the mid 1950s mid to late 1950s and uh, when the project blue book the official air force investigation into the ufo phenomenon was sort of at its height um, it's now so sort of well known that certain at certain times certain instances uh, the investigators for blue book were doing was not uh, looking at uh, genuinely sort of in, in, uh, investigating people's UFO sightings, they were actually monitoring uh, the visibility of the newly developed uh, U-2 aircraft as it flew over built-up areas. And, uh, and there's a lot of controversy about the statement, which occurs in a, a internal uh, CIA history about UFOs by a man called Gerald Haynes, but. Certainly on some occasions this was what was being done. So the Air Force uh, personnel would turn up and meet Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, who would say, yes, we saw this very strange thing glinting in the sunlight, uh, moving in a straight line, and we you know, really didn't know what it was, and we were worried it might be an alien craft or it could be the Russians. We just don't know. And the Air Force guys would say, don't worry, uh, Mrs. Johnson, what you saw was... Uh, the planet Venus, or it was a stray weather balloon, or it was, you know, nothing at all, just a, a note in your eye, uh, full well knowing that actually what they'd seen was, was the U-2, and this would be useful for them when considering, uh, you know, how people would, how and whether people would see the U-2 as it flew over the Soviet Union, uh, which is what it was tasked to do. And part of the reason with this was in its first two years, the uh, U-2 was actually, as most aircraft were, painted a futuristic, uh, well, wasn't painted at all, it was a futuristic so metallic, shiny metallic silver, uh, which uh, at sunset and sunrise would, would catch the sun and reflect very brightly and draw attention to itself. And later on it was, it was sort of a, 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 a more somber, sober uh, gunmetal grey. So that was one aspect was sort of, yes, diverting attention from uh, your real uh, real toys and your real technologies. And I think that's certainly also part of the, uh, the Benowitz story was to mask the uh, stealth development of the stealth program and uh, to probably, I would guess, to point people out to places like Dulce, New Mexico, where Paul Benowitz was encouraged to believe there was a lot of UFO activity going on and even an alien base. 
while um you know the the uh certainly by the uh, early to mid eighties the test flights and uh of the stealth fighter and 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 later the bomber were going on at uh place like area fifty one and Tonopah and next door so yes it's a kind of you know look over here look look in this direction there's a there's an amazing uh, underground alien base and ignore what's going on um, over over in this direction where the uh, strange ungainly arrow head shaped aircraft is coming into land um but there are there are i think there are multiple other you know there are many other reasons um i think one of them and if we look at the um cia so the 1953 robertson panel uh where they sort of officially enter the ufo story and they sort of talk about the issues um that the that the ufo kind of panic is raises uh, one of the things they talk about is the need to monitor ufo groups and also to sort of control them and to get um the the, the ufo community sort of into one place and to get them sort of organized so that they're easier to to uh, to watch so to keep tabs on and when you it, say it, that about being in the business of watching over UFO groups, can we then become paranoid enough to say that maybe one or more of the members or people who are officers in some of these UFO groups are really engaged in overt disinformation? They're working for the authorities. Um, it's it's the sort of uh, statement that's often bandied around. I mean, if you look back to uh, NICAP, uh, uh, run headed by. Uh, sorry, mental blank. Major um, Donald Kehoe. D- Donald Kehoe, sorry. I got distracted, my screen turned off as I was thinking. Yes, Major Donald Kehoe. Um, you know, we see a lot of uh, former uh, CIA. You have uh, Roscoe Hillencarter, uh, who was a Navy man who then uh, was, was ran the uh, CIA and then ended up very senior in in, uh, in NICAP, and there are, there are others in there as well. And everyone... Uh, who's a new VC will said they were genuinely interested in in uh, the subject and in the phenomenon, but it's very hard to kind of separate uh, people's lifelong involvement in in the intelligence and military arena with uh, you know with the fact that just a few years before the CIA had been telling its people to get involved in in the UFO field and in the UFO business, and there are obvious reasons for this and for people uh for the intelligence organizations to send their uh send their kind of uh, officers into the field because uh you know often it's often going to be the case that what ufo hunters and people looking for uh for ufos especially when they're congregating around air force bases and and uh, sort of and uh areas where they're not supposed to be it'd be very easy for agents of unfriendly powers to kind of get involved in this uh, in these communities and and pick up tidbits of information that when pieced with other bits of information that perhaps the ufo community doesn't have could reveal quite a lot of uh, technical intelligence about new new uh, weapons uh, development one of the concerns of nicap that i had is if <laughs> you're going to have an organization top-heavy with military people as they were, at least as far as the board was concerned. Mm -hmm. Even Richard Hall was in, I think, the Air Force or something Mm -hmm. before he came into civilian life. Wouldn't that be too obvious? I mean, how can you believe that they would be so transparent? You look at NICAP and you say, well, it's got to be a military front because you got Major Donald Kehoe and all his buddies from the Air Force, from the CIA, from the Marines, from the Navy, etc., etc. Isn't that just too darn obvious? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it could be a case of hiding in plain sight, or it could be. I, 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 I'm prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt, and like, like you say, uh, Kehoe, you know, wanted uh, NICAP to be a, a serious organization, to be a serious force, and it would have made sense to him to uh, pull his, you know, his his buddies and people he knew who were serious players in, you know, in the military. Uh, military uh, organizations to, to take part in this. And the other, the other interesting character, though, again, given, given the uh, Robertson panel's conclusions, you have uh, Colonel Joseph Bryan, who is actually the, the very first CIA chief of political and psychological warfare, and he was uh, a, a sort of 
for, for, for a while anyway, a senior player in NICAP. Um, and curiously enough, actually, his son uh, was CBD Brian, who wrote Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind about uh, in the mid-90s about the abduction story. Um, and he's actually gone on the record as saying that his dad was just genuinely fascinated with, with the UFO story and, and uh, certainly wasn't involved on any kind of professional level. But as they say, once a spook, always a spook, and there's always going to be a time when you, uh, you know, you're, you're asked to uh, pass on information about uh, what you're doing, if, it, if it's useful and if you're still uh, in, in uh, good contact with your former employers. And they call you back so into the game well. like they do on television. Yeah. We have <laughs> Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Man. The co-host is Nicholas Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in The Paracast. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. If you're in a service business, that's money ringing in your ears. If your phone's not ringing, chances are it's a problem with your marketing. Landscapers, painters, roofers, carpet cleaners, pet sitters, handymen, anyone with a residential service business can build a huge and loyal customer base fast with the Magic Yellow Flyer. No more expensive newspaper, yellow pages, or internet pay-per-click ads. The Magic Yellow Flyer will have new customers calling you within one week. The Magic Yellow Flyer marketing system is the most effective and inexpensive way to build a referral only service business in a short period of time and the magic yellow flyer comes with an outrageous one year guarantee you will get new customers or your money back for details go to magicyellowflyer.com no matter what business you're in the magic yellow flyer marketing system will work for you visit magicyellowflyer.com put the magic yellow flyer to work for you today visit magicyellowflyer.com can you live with minor aches and pains maybe but oftentimes those won't go away pains become so debilitating that we are not able to do things we used to like go for a walk garden or even button a shirt now restore normal function naturally and give yourself the freedom to move with recovery extra strength over-the-counter drugs will stop the pain but at the expense of your liver recovery extra strength is the number one solution for pain and inflammation it contains Nutricol, a unique proprietary blend of green tea and grapes and is made in canada under strict health canada oversight of natural products if you suffer from arthritis bursitis tendonitis back or other aches and pains use recovery extra strength call 866-543-3388 or go to remarkablerecovery.com get free shipping on orders of fifty dollars or more when you use checkout code gcn radio call 1-866-543-3388 or go to remarkablerecovery.com for recovery extra strength for pain-free mobility What is a wind generator? How can the wind produce power for a small cabin? How can wind energy be stored and used during an emergency? Can I assemble my own wind generator? For answers to questions about wind power, visit windbluepower.com. Did you know the wind could provide your family with emergency power? It can with a wind generator from windbluepower.com. Learn how our amazing Light Breeze wind generator kit start charging a 12-volt battery in just 6 mile per hour wind. Or see the new Cyclone X2 dual kit featuring two wind generators on just one tower. And learn why schools and universities across the country utilize our products to teach about wind power and alternative energy at windbluepower.com. All kits qualify for a 30% IRS tax credit for residential energy efficient property. Enter coupon code RADIO for a 5% discount at windbluepower.com. That's windbluepower.com. 
bluepower.com or call 800-976-0026. That's 800-976-0026. Tired of searching for great talk radio? Search no more. I'm told that it has everything. We are the GCN Radio Network. Genesis. This is the Paracast. You never know what's going to happen next. We have Mark Pilkington. The book is Mirage Men, an adventure into paranoia, espionage, psychological warfare, and UFOs. The co-host is Nicholas Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're still in the Paracast. So the logical question here, is there an organization, a specific organization, of these Mirage Men, or is it just a bunch of different agencies, different people, depending on the case and the needs? I, my sense is that it's B. I think this is uh, just uh, something that's kind of pulled together um, as and when it's the right thing to do. You know, and and uh, perhaps there are certain people who are sort of better informed and more interested in the in the wider UFO field, and they get um, you know maybe they get called on for their expertise and their knowledge. And it's, it's worth remembering that back in uh, 1980, when uh, uh, William Moore, author of the Roswell incident, got involved with the Air Force Office of Special Investigation and uh, Rick Doty, you know, his role was to provide them with intelligence on what the current hot topics and sort of stories of interest and the current sort of directions of research in the UFO field were. And, you know, they really, really lent on him heavily for information. So it's not as if they knew themselves what, uh, you know, it's not as if they'd been keeping close tabs on, on the UFO uh, community. So I think they you know, they probably do, these days, they, I think they scour the internet, I would guess, if they need information. And uh, I was recently chatting to Lee Nicholson, who runs the Open Mind Forum, who says that there's a constant stream of uh, intelligence servers kind of pointed in their direction of people who may well just have an interest in the material and at other times might be, you know, fishing for new schemes and new uh, ideas for, for deceptions. But, um, you know, I think the UFO story is, is a useful one and it's a perpetually useful one that is as much of a headache for the Air Force and for the intelligence services as it is a, a useful cover. And one of the things I tried to do in the book was each time I uh, sort of brought in... Um, a reference to what I was sort of trying to suggest could have been a deception operation within the UFO uh, arena was trying to bring in an analogous example from outside. So, you know, for, uh, other instances where either supernatural or esoteric or uh, folkloric um, sort of ideas and 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 uh, concepts had been deployed in intelligence operations and I, so I, I think you know what I was trying to show is that uh, it's not all about UFOs UFOs are just one of the things that that can be uh, can be pulled up out of the dressing up box when it's when it's useful to do so um, but uh, we mentioned uh, Leon Davidson earlier and one of the things uh, he, he seemed to believe that there was much more of a focused uh, kind of UFO themed operation going on and he, he thought much of it was to do with the CIA even to the extent uh, of um, some of George Adamski's uh, sort of secondary contacts where he'd be driven out into the desert in a black stretch Buick I think it was and uh, sort of given strange drinks and made to watch uh, films of traveling through space uh, Davidson suggested that uh, these were, were kind of Intelligence, uh, sort of theme park rides being set up for, for Adamski's benefit, and he also suggested that there was a deliberate, uh, in the style of uh, Bernard Newman's The Flying Saucer, which we talked about earlier, that there was a deliberate, um, sort of program to spread the idea that extra humanoid extraterrestrials, uh, very similar to ones in in uh, the day the Earth stood still, were visiting Earth, and I think. You can sort of understand the, his, you can understand Davidson's um, thinking about this, and you can also understand why someone like Alan Doas, who is a, a very you know thoughtful and engaged 
uh, man might see this as 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 useful um, at the end of World War Two, which was you know only only uh, sort of five to seven years in the past, depending when we're looking at. Uh, there was a real fear, I think, that uh, that, that America and 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 the, and uh, the sort of um, allied nations might lose their faith in God and and become a kind of morally uh, bankrupt, sort of drifting uh, dr- drifting nation of of, of, sort of nihilists, because um, you know what God could possibly have allowed the horrors of World War Two to take place. You mentioned George Adamski, so yeah. the implication here is that Adamski was not someone who just made it all up, but he was a victim of some kind of government intervention. Is that what you're suggesting here? And that's, of course, what possibly Dr. Davidson was suggesting. That's certainly what uh, Davidson was, was suggesting, yes. And I'm sure Nick has something to say on this because I actually used some of his research in, in uh, telling this part of the story. Well, the reason I want to mention this, and this is something that may be ahead of what Nick might want to say, and that is I knew another contactee, Hmm. Howard Menger. Oh, yeah. He had the same statement. You know, I remember this lunch that Jim Mosley and I had with Howard Menger many years ago. And Menger said, you know, I think I was part of some sort of government experiment. Mm -hmm. So are we tying that into the same source? Yeah. It's uh, funny you should say that because I spoke to, um, sorry, my memories, um, Timothy Green Beckley, um, he was based in New York, I think. And right. Really we all forget Tim Beckley. You know, we always forget his name. But I've known uh, Tim Beckley since we were both kids, so it goes back right. a long time. And uh, I actually was in contact with Beckley because he, like you, was involved with Menger. And uh, I asked him about this rumor that, that uh, Howard had said, had admitted that he thought he was part of a, you know, some kind of intelligence project. And... Uh, Beckley, um, he he wasn't really so sort of prepared to to go on the record about that, so I actually didn't use that story in the book. But I yeah, but you know what, Menger said that to me, and he said that to Jim Mosley, and we sat there, and that's what his position was. Yeah, I, I think it's entirely possible. That, Nick, sorry, it was going to say something. Nick, sorry, you want to amplify that at all because you, having yeah. written a book about contactees, this encroaches on your territory, which we're happy to do. So maybe you can contribute something. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's two important points worth noting. One is the fact that, you know, the contactees were watched very closely by the FBI and other agencies in the 50s. We know that because the files have surfaced through the Freedom of Information Act, mm-hmm. primarily from the FBI. Um, Adamski's FBI file is about 80 pages. George Van Tassel's is just under 400 and, and spans 13 years. And it's quite clear from some of the internal references that the concern was that the some of the contactees were talking about scenarios that were sort of pushing communism, the idea that the aliens were communist or socialist. And, you know, and I think the fact that the penny dropped, if you like, in the FBI and di- different agencies that hang on, you know, these people are lecturing to thousands of people out at Giant Rock. They're selling, like in Adamski's case, flying sources have landed, literally thousands and thousands of copies of a book. And they're saying that communist aliens are the future of the world. You can well understand why someone may want to engage in some sort of psyop to either discredit them or perhaps, as Mark points out, you know, actually fabricate incidents to drive them away from that communist political angle and more down a, a, a more of a conventional UFO path. Now, another person who we know this was done to, well, I think it was done to, and I wrote about in Contactees, was Orfeo Angelucci, who had these various experiences, allegedly in the late 40s and early 50s, of a classic um, contactee style. But in his follow-up book to his initial one, he talked about how he met this man who he names in the book Adam, who wanted to talk to him about UFO experiences. And Adam said, you know, we should meet at this diner out in the desert, the California desert, which is sort of classic contactee territory, you know, diners Mm -hmm. in the desert. And um, Angela, she went there, and this guy, Adam, said, you know, let's sit down, have lunch or dinner, whatever the time of the day it was. And Adam basically said words to the effect of, before I can tell you about my experiences, you need to swallow this pill. And, you know, Angela, she, whether being gullible, an idiot or whatever, 
You know, he just went ahead and swallowed a pill given to him by a complete stranger. And nothing happened for about 30 minutes. After that time, however, he began to feel a little bit unusual, and he said that the room seemed, the room itself and the furniture seemed to take on like some sort of ethereal meaning, and colours danced around the room, and the glass on the table shimmered in a strange light. It was almost like he'd been put under an LSD trip or something I was like thinking that. that maybe Adam was really Timothy Leary in disguise, but before we yeah, get into that... Been. It could have been. <laughs> but, um, what happened was that Angelucci ended up spilling his guts to Adam about his experiences. And we'll have to get into that. That opens up the can of worms that we want to get into in a moment. We'll get into that can of worms. We have Nick Redfern as our co-host. Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Men, joins us. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you own an Apple iPhone and love to listen to your favorite programs on GCN, I've got good news for you. I'm proud to announce that GCN has a brand new iPhone app available for our dedicated listeners at GCNlive.com. Listen to your favorite hard-hitting GCN programs live or on demand right on your iPhone. And the best part? The GCN iPhone app can be yours absolutely free. Download the iPhone app today by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this This is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. We are entering some fascinating territory this week. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. We have Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Men, an exciting adventure into paranoia, espionage, psychological warfare, and UFOs. And Nick Redfern is our co-host, reminding us of something he talked about earlier a few months back when he was interviewed about his book about contactees and about this meeting in the diner between Orfeo Angelucci and Adam. And he takes the pill and he suffers, I guess, Angelucci, what we might call a LSD trip of some sort, right? That's how it comes across very much like that. He talks about the room being filled with vivid colors. Um, literally, furniture takes on some sort of psychological or ethereal meaning. He says that in his glass of juice or whatever he's got in front of him, that he suddenly sees this little woman dancing in the liquid. <laughs> and he's, he's totally spaced out, but starts talking all about his UFO experiences. And on top of that, he says that all the while he's doing this, there are two guys sat at the table next to him, staring intently in military uniforms, no less. Now, of course, as Mark knows from his book, um, if you look at the time frame of this, early 50s, 52, 53, this is when you had things like the Frank Olsen death, um, MK Ultra, early LSD research, all sorts of things like this. And, you know, I don't want to take too much time away from Mark. It's his interview, but just to suffice to say that it sounds to me very much like that certain of the contactees who were seen as potentially being troublesome from a political perspective may well have been tampered with in some fashion to either get them to change their story or to influence their stories to a more suitable and acceptable mindset. It may actually be ironically that people like the CIA didn't want to destroy the contactee mystery. They may have wanted to use it for their own ends, but wanted to get rid of this pro-communist angle that so many of the contactees seem to espouse. I mean, that's really fascinating, Nick. And and just looking at comparing uh, statements from um, Adamski with those of of, also of Angelucci. I mean, Adamski is saying, uh, telling an FBI agent, within the next 12 months, San Diego will be bombed. The United States is in the same state of deterioration as the Roman Empire prior to its collapse. The government is a corrupt form of government, and capitalists are enslaving the poor. That's not the kind of thing. They wanted beings from outer space uh, to be uh, broadcasting, whereas Angelucci, uh, in contrast, 
who was actually uh, Carl Jung's favourite contact who is saying, uh, you know, com communism is Earth's present fundamental enemy and not yeah. beneath it, the banner spearhead of the united force of evil. It's a, uh, you know, and uh, so we can see who, who was on uh, which mm. side in that uh, inclusion. Yeah. The interesting um, thing is, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. The interesting thing is that Angelucci, in one of his two books, actually says that during a, a tour of the east coast of the U.S., he was approached by what he described as a mysterious group that wanted him to slant his lectures down, as he called it, the party line. And he refused to do that. And it was round about this time that he got this visit from this guy, Adam. So even though Angelucci wasn't promoting it, it may well have been the case that somebody wanted to know who wanted him to promote it. I think that's a possibility. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing we really mustn't forget that at this time, um, you know, we don't think of it anymore, but the, the threat of communism and of, and of uh, so communist infiltrators inside America and inside even the mm -hmm. you know the military and the government um, and even in the White House was was not just a fear it was an absolute reality so mm -hmm. anybody who was you know espousing anything that seemed uh, to be promoting so communist viewpoints was was really treated extremely seriously and I, I believe actually you know my my sort of hunch is that's why uh, the Murray Island incident happened with Kenneth Arnold back in uh, July forty seven because after his uh, June fighting of uh, uh, over Mount Rainier, uh, Arnold rather certainly wasn't talking about outer space. He was talking about uh, possibly Soviet uh, mm -hmm. experimental craft, but he also talked a lot about uh, American craft possibly using atomic engines and uh, the irony was that he wouldn't have known it but at the time uh, the Air Force was actually sort of on the drawing boards at least experimenting with the idea of nuclear propulsion for aircraft so to have him going uh, talking willy-nilly to the press and anyone who would listen about these things was you know potentially uh, made him a, a threat so I think what the Murray Island incident may have been about was sort of setting up a, a, a sort of honey trap in order to uh, investigate him and his real motives. And of course, it ended tragically with the first two deaths ever uh, for the uh, the newly formed United States Air Force. I'll tell you what I wanted to ask you a question here. You touched on Roswell earlier. Can we consider Roswell in the same framework that it was something that was staged and just maybe got out of control that people today still believe it was a UFO crash? I I, I mean Roswell is just such a as as we all know just such an incredible tangle that I I'm sort of hesitant to get too involved in it, but I do talk about it uh, in the book and I you know I think one thing I've sort of wondered is this. Personally, I think it may well have been uh, the Mogul balloon that the Air Force say it was, which is probably the most controversial <laughs> viewpoint you can put forward. You know, it may well have been a Mogul balloon and perhaps uh, the um, Roswell Army Air Force Base press people thought, well, the best thing to do is just cover it up, and if we say it's a flying saucer, then no one will take us seriously. And then, of course, this... Uh, shot around the world, and their superiors may well have said, "You said what? Are you crazy? You know, get get on the uh, get on the telegraph and the radio right now, and uh, tell them it was just a just a weather balloon, and 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 hence the staging of the of the famous photograph with Jesse Marcel. So I think that's one possibility. And the thing to bear in mind is that this absolutely worked, and there are next to no mentions of Roswell in the UFO literature until. Uh, 1979, 1980, when when Bill Moore, who got involved with the uh, Benowitz story and and Rick Doty and the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, he researched and wrote the book that was uh, co, that at least on the cover was co-authored with uh, Charles Burlett. And so Roswell just didn't exist. I was re reminded of this recently talking to John Rimmer of Magonia. And one of his colleagues, Peter Rogerson, compiled what was considered at the time, you know, really the most comprehensive database of UFO accounts uh, through to the sort of, through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And until the Roswell material started coming out in the late 70s, there was Roswell didn't even figure in this in this database, which really gives a sense of 
what a non-story it was until it was uh, re-excavated. So I think whatever the reason and whatever they did, it, it, we know that it worked. Well, the one thing about Roswell that bothers a lot of people and bothers me is the fact that we have people remembering what happened 20, 30, 40 years previously. And mm-hmm. memories can change. Popular oh. culture can change. Mm-hmm. It's really difficult to iron this out. Now, yes, the people who support Roswell say there is a remarkable consistency in the stories, and I'll leave it at that. I want to ask you, Mark, about something else because we focus mostly on UFOs, and this is peripherally connected to it. One of the questions, in fact, the question most often posed in our forums over at forum.thepowercast.com mm-hmm. about your book they're asking about crop circles. That's all they seem to be concerned about. So tell me about crop circles and how this is part of this picture. Okay, I mean, I, I, I would quickly like to just to, re- to to back you up there and reiterate your point on the fallibility of memory. And actually, very quickly, I talk in the book about uh, Elizabeth uh, Loftus's uh, experiments, whereby she was able to induce false memories in people that they had met. Bugs Bunny as a child at uh, Disneyland, and of course uh, you know, the lawyers of Warner Brothers and Walt Disney would not allow uh, Bugs Bunny to be wandering around Disneyland. But without unless they met Mel Blanc, of course. And that's, that's <laughs> and, <laughs> Ladies and, and gentlemen, cover, Mel yeah. Blanc, the late Mel Blanc comedian, was originally the voice of Bugs Bunny in Porky Pig, and I think his son took it over. This is just trivia that nobody cares about. But let me tell everybody that we have Mark Pilkington, and he's author of a book called Mirage Men. It's a hardcover book subtitled An Adventure into Paranoia, Espionage, Psychological Warfare, and UFOs. And we were focusing briefly on how memories may be altered over a period of time. I don't think I met Bugs Bunny as a kid, by the way. <laughs> Our co-host is Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in The Paracast. Hey, neighbors. Ever thought about creating a website? With HostGator, you can create your own website with your very own .com domain name. HostGator has a free site builder and thousands of design templates to create your website today. Whether you want to create a blog, a photo gallery, a family page, or a website for your business, HostGator has the right plan for you, starting at less than 5 bucks a month for ultra-reliable website hosting with 99.9% uptime and true 24 by 7 live support available by phone, chat, or email and based right here in the U.S. Don't be left without a website. It's more affordable and easier than you think. Sign up at technightowl.com slash gator, that's G-A-T-O-R, to get the lowest possible price. At HostGator, that's technightowl.com slash gator to get a special deal on all their web hosting services. When making important financial decisions, you should always know the facts. That's why Midas Resources is willing to pay you to read the facts. Midas Resources, a team of hand-picked financial specialists with decades of financial experience who are ready to provide you with state-of-the-art, up-to-date financial services. Midas Resources offers a host of services and stands behind their products. In fact, if you call and order their free Midas report, Midas Resources will pay you. This detailed report will provide you with financial history on the safest and most profitable areas to invest in. If you read the report, Midas Resources will send you a free Walking Liberty Silver Half Dollar. So what are you waiting for? Get the facts and call Midas Resources toll free at 888-292-2709. That's 888-292-2709. And remember, if you read the Midas report, you'll receive a free Walking Liberty Silver Half Dollar. Men, when you want the spark back in your love life, when you want to bring back intimacy, when you want to please the special woman in your life, use Mojo Ryzen. Mojo Ryzen is a safe, revolutionary herbal sexual formula for men that combines ancient Chinese school of thought and modern science to significantly support stamina, performance, and pleasure. Mojo Ryzen is a proven 100% natural product that works the first time, every time. Mojo Ryzen works even after consuming alcohol. Mojo Ryzen will not give you unwanted 
unintended side effects. Mojo Ryzen will allow you to give your partner what they deserve. Try just three capsules of Mojo Ryzen, and if not completely satisfied, send back the remainder for a full refund. Buy Mojo Ryzen at mojo-radio.com. That's mojo-radio.com. Or call toll-free 1-877-330-1120. That's 877-330-1120. Go big, go strong with Mojo Ryzen all night long. Where have all the military surplus stores gone? Don't worry, you don't need one. Because everything you need at Military Surplus is at MainMilitary.com. That's M-A-I-N-E Military.com. One of the last surviving true military surplus stores in the country. Go online now to MainMilitary.com and discover a source for hard-to-find surplus items at true surplus prices. Surplus gun cleaning kits as low as $2.99. Complete chemical suits as low as $11.99. See our huge selection of gas masks, filters, and accessories. Finish it. M10 gas masks are three for $30, and Swiss filters are three for $12. Searching for Strike Anywhere matches? MainMilitary.com has them, plus a whole new product line of survival and first aid kits and lots more. Get free shipping on orders over $50 only at MainMilitary.com. That's M-A-I-N-E Military.com. Or call 877-608-0179, 877-608-0179. MainMilitary.com, the main name in military supply. On air, online, and on demand. They say we offer simple answers to complex problems. We are the GCN Radio Network. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Get in on all the action at forum.theparacast.com. We have Mark Pilkington joining us. Nick Redfern is the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. And we're talking about the accuracy of memories. And very briefly, you mentioned how people were made to think that they met Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. And this is a way of manipulating memories. So anytime people remember things that happened as a child... Is that something that may be very faulty, may be very colored? Yes, absolutely. And I think, as you were saying, it's, you know, trying to remember what you were doing this time yesterday, let alone what you were doing 40, 50, 60 years ago. I think we have to be very, very careful of uh, people's recollections of, you know, of of alleged uh, uh, UFO events. And and we were referencing the the Roswell story. It was actually a very good... A uh, little sort of story in the new uh, issue of Forty and Times, which is a British sort of uh, magazine of, of anomalous and, and uh, paranormal phenomena, with a, an alien abductee who uh, was convinced for years that he had childhood memories of being, uh, you know, classic abduction memories of being picked up by the grave and tampered with medically and emotionally and, and uh, psychically, and was absolutely convinced was very much involved in the. UK abduction sort of scene as such as it was uh, until he found his actual notebook from the period uh, that he remembered these events uh, taking place and his notebooks described experiences that were entirely mundane and had absolutely nothing to do with aliens and he you know, realized that he'd allowed himself to kind of project these memories into his own past, into his own unconscious sorry, so you have to um, you know, we really do have to be careful. And, and if, you, if we consider um, a lot of, certainly the historic UFO incidents as kind of stories, which is effectively uh, what they are as, as sort of folklore to a certain extent, then uh, if you look at the way they escalate and they become increasingly sort of involved and convoluted and dramatic over the years, that's, you know, if you think of, you know, fisherman tales, you know, the, the, fish, the fish keep getting bigger and the story keeps... Uh, keep getting more more involved and, and more dramatic. Um, I'll tell you what, let me just shortcut this because we only have a few segments left. Okay. And I do want to get into crop circles in a moment. But yeah. can you say at the end of it there is a real UFO mystery that's involved? Yeah, I think there is. I do. Um, and I think that the, the, the tragedy of all of this uh, disinformation and deception and game playing that goes on within the UFO world and the UFO community is that uh, we may well therefore be missing the true signal and there may well be 
uh, you know, there may be, may be one needle still buried amongst the haystacks of disinformation. Um, my sense is that as yet, and, and this will be controversial, as yet I don't, I've yet to see any uh, convincing evidence that's sort of made me feel that uh, we have had an ongoing uh, engagement or visit with or visitation from extraterrestrial intelligences. Um, but that's just me, and I, I certainly would never want to um, stop anyone else from, from believing what, what they wanted to believe. But I think people, you know, really do have to take very careful con uh, account and consideration of the extent to which this field is open to manipulation and exploitation by uh, tricksters and, and sort of deception specialists, both within the uh, military and intelligence organizations and within the UFO community itself. Okay, crop circles. As I said, people who inquired about your book talked about crop circles. So can we assume that all the crop circles are fake, that people just make those things in their yeah. backyards just for the heck of it? They're not fake, but they're, they're real. But yes, they're made by, they are made by people. And not in their own backyards, uh, usually, well, almost always in uh, other people's backyards, usually farmers who are growing uh, wheat or, or rape in the UK, certainly are the most uh, pliable crops. But yeah, my sort of general rule of thumb, and I can say this as someone who was involved in uh, making uh, crop circles for nine, over nine years, is that as a general rule of thumb, anything more than a kind of misshapen blob has been uh, made by people, by groups of, of, of uh, anything from three to, um, or two actually, to uh, at most I'd say 12, 12 people. And, and to be fair, a few misshapen blobs are made by people as well. You know, it I depends on your ability at artistic pursuits? Or exactly. are there basically these models they could just trace? To make no, crop no, circles. It's, it's quite involved and involves. A lot. It does. It does require a lot of skill and you know hard hard work and a lot of planning. And you can't just go into a field and um, you know just sort of freestyle it because you'll you'll make a horrible mess. That just, it doesn't work like that. It does require a great deal of preparation. And and it's no. It's you know it's not something um, to be dismissed. It's an incredibly elaborate and, and genuinely skillful art form is, is how I would, would uh, sort of present it. But I think the interesting part, you know, uh, the, the, the construction itself is like being a giant spirograph or a giant geometry set. And really the, the art to the crop circle phenomenon, I think, is in the reception, is in the, the people who view them and generate, you know, really quite uh, stunning and, and amazing and, and even beautiful um, interpretations around what are effectively, um, you know, patterns uh, etched into the etched into the fields of, of uh, the English countryside. Okay, so, let's expand that a little bit because we have just yeah. a couple of segments left. And that is, what about general paranormal events? Now, you mentioned UFOs applying to a certain category of disinformation. We have crop circles. Is that part of the government plot, or is it just always individuals who are playing games? Uh, it's, it's, I don't think there's ever been, uh, as, as far as I know, and uh, my friends who are, I was making crop circles with them are much more deeply enmeshed in the uh, culture surrounding them than I am. They pretty much know who has made everything over a year and, and actually going back to quite some time. Now, it's, it's curious that there, there's only one, I think, that um, that I remember they couldn't uh, identify if I'm right, and if John Lundberg was on the line, I'm sure he'd be able to correct me, but that's the uh, famous Mandelbrot set uh, formation, and actually John and his colleague Rob Irving were uh, sort of hired to recreate this for the BBC a few years ago, which they did in, in uh, driving rain and, and wind one night, and they actually said it was a difficult formation to do, but that's as far as I know, that's the only sort of classic formation they haven't been able to, to pin to a particular team or group of people. Okay, um, back to normal paranormal events or abnormal yeah. paranormal events. Other than UFOs, and we're setting aside crop circles, what else are they doing? This is a question that's going to create a cliffhanger because we'll have to have it answered in the next section, which is what other types of strange events 
are the disinformation specialists, mirage men, or otherwise trying to produce or <laughs> or create. A reminder that Nick Redfern returns next week as a guest with Chris O'Brien as the co-host. Nick will be talking about his new book, Final Events. We have Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Men, an adventure into paranoia, espionage, psychological warfare, and UFOs. The co-host is Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. Great news for pure water lovers. The Big Berkey water filter is available once again. And stay tuned to hear about a valuable offer from Berkey Water Filters. Choosing the right water purification system can be a daunting task. That's why BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com shows you a cost and benefit comparison. The Berkey water filter is economical with a single set of filters that can last for 5 to 10 years. Berkey water filters are healthy and far superior to other filtration systems. They remove harmful pathogenic bacteria, cysts, parasites, and unhealthy chemicals like chlorine. And Berkey water filter systems are powerful enough to purify both treated and untreated water, like stagnant ponds. Get the gold standard in water filters at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. For a limited time, choose a free shower filter, fluoride filters, or two Sport Berkey bottles with every system purchase. And GCN listeners get 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Details at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com or call 1-877-99-BERKEY. That's 1-877-99-BERKEY. If you owe money to the IRS, you can't make the problem go away by yourself. But with the help of Dan Pilla, you can get your problem solved once and for all. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. For 30 years, I've helped thousands of people solve their tax debt problem, and I can help you solve yours, too. We take a very simple but proven three-step approach to solving your problem. First, we stabilize IRS collection actions so you don't have to worry about the IRS seizing your bank account or paycheck. Next, we build a comprehensive plan to get your tax debt reduced to the fullest extent possible, sometimes even completely eliminated. And finally, we work with you every step of the way to get your problem solved once and for all. Call us for a free consultation. Call 1-800-346-6829. We'll work together to get your problem solved guaranteed. Dan Pilla has been protecting taxpayers from the IRS for three decades, and he can help you too. Call us today at 800 800- 346-6829. That's 800 34 no tax Warning for all Gulf Coast disaster survivors. Be aware that dangerous gases are in the air you breathe. Benzene, hydrogen sulfide, methylene chloride, and Corexit 9500. Keep your body clean with micro plant powder. For all Gulf Coast residents and all who want to be healthy, HempUSA.org brings you a new formulation of micro plant powder with lactobacillus acidophilus. Rebuilding your immune system while detoxing the rest of your body. Pulling out positive toxins, heavy metals, viruses, fungus, bacteria, and parasites. Cleans and purifies the blood, lungs, stomach, and colon. Microplant powder will help eliminate these dangerous chemicals from the body used in the Gulf cleanup. At HempUSA.org, we want you to try our number one selling detox product, Microplant Powder. Call and order at 1-908-691-2608. 1-908-691-2608. Or visit us at HempUSA.org today. How do you spell hard-hitting talk radio? G C N. The Genesis Communications Radio Network. You've entered another dimension. You've entered the Paracast.
We return with Mark Pilkington, author of Mirage Men, and Nick Redfern's our co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. So let us look at that other than UFOs and such. What other kinds of paranormal events are perhaps being staged? I think uh, I would guess that um, possibly quite a few. I mean, the ones I talk about in the book, there are two that are real, my real favorite. And one is uh, from the early 1950s in the Philippines when uh, there was a, a fear that uh, the insurgent communist guerrillas in the Philippines, who are called the Huck, uh, were going to uh, stage a sort of a coup and take over. Uh, so, so the um, CIA sent in one of their kind of best men, a man called uh, Colonel Edward Lansdale, who was actually, ironically, a, a, an advertising uh, executive sort of before he got involved in intelligence. And I think there's sort of definite parallels to be drawn between the work of the Mirage Men and, and the advertising industry. But um, And, and uh, Lansdale, something of a legend, he's said to have been the inspiration for the character Alden Pyle in Graham Greene's book, The Quiet American. Um, but he was sent in to uh, the Philippines of initially undercover to uh, kind of get a sense of what it was that uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the culture there, the people there were interested in and, and what they hoped for and, of course, what they were afraid of. And the, the key thing he found they were afraid of was a fearsome vampire called the Aswang. Um, and this sort of goes back uh, deep into sort of Philippine uh, folklore and mythology. So... What they did was they began seeding rumors that the Aswang lived in the uh, and the the region occupied by the Huk by the communist guerrillas, and um, the rumors sort of soon spread and 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 the fear began to to spread amongst the sort of amongst the uh, villagers and the and the uh, guerrillas. Then one night uh, the guerrillas were out on a patrol, uh, followed closely by Lansdale and his team. They plucked the last unlucky uh, Huck from from the patrol, hung him from a tree, drained him of blood, uh, killing him uh, through punch marks in his neck, then dropped him back onto the trail so that when uh, his uh, his comrades came back, they found him and their worst fears were confirmed that the the Aswang was well and truly at large in, in the area and actually uh, they fled soon afterwards and... Uh, Lansdale's larger mission to sort of get rid of the uh, communist menace uh, through this and other operations was a success, at least for a few years. So I think, you know, you can see the extent to which um, they would, you know, stop at nothing really to um, get their get their work done and, and, and uh, fight fight the uh, communist threat, and that, if that included um, killing people with, uh, with fake vampires, then so be it. Another one I liked uh, actually comes from uh, the uh, the uh, Vietnam War when the Army's uh, Sixth Fire Ops Battalion uh, developed an audio recording called the Wandering Soul, um, which they would uh, roam around the forest at night um, playing from uh, from sort of special loudspeaker mounted uh, backpacks uh, mounted on backpacks. And the cassette, the uh, sorry, the audio uh, tape, as a magnetic reel-to-reel tape, uh, preyed on Vietnamese traditions of the unquiet dead, and contained a conversation between a little girl and uh, the wandering soul of her dead father, who'd been killed away from their village uh, while fighting the Americans. And they used uh, traditional Vietnamese uh, funeral music, as well as lots of eerie reverb effects, to uh, to kind of transmit this spooky message through the night, and it was apparently so successful that uh, a number of American soldiers were, were spooked out by it as well. Um, and one, one interesting point that's made is that um, the uh, Vietnamese soldiers would always shoot in the direction of this uh, recording, but the, the insinuation being that it, you know, they were terrified that uh, there were ghosts at large, um, and I presume that they could kill them with bullets. So, so that's two, you know, two very uh, clear examples of other supernatural and and paranormal kind of themes that have at the, in the past been exploited uh, by the intelligence and deception specialists 
And I think you know, what I'm trying to show in the book is that UFOs are just another example of this, or albeit one that's kind of uh, become much more uh, kind of deeply ingrained into the culture and, and actually has ended up turning around to uh, bite the uh, mirage men on, on the rear because these ideas are now kind of deeply uh, entrenched within the uh, military uh, community, within the intelligence community, even with some people in the White House and certainly in the popular culture and the sort of and the and the sort of uh, uh, wider you know uh, w wider Western mindset. So and I think you know it, it, it's something that's kind of grown probably uh, out of out of their control by this time. Well, the one thing, of course, is that you can find UFO sightings before there was this military industrial and intelligence complex. Yeah. You can find sightings that, if real, involve simultaneous. Radar, visual sightings, sometimes with photographs. So there appears to be some sort of genuine UFO mystery in the midst of all this junk. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd, I'd agree. And certainly, you know, the, the, the UFO mystery certainly predates Kenneth Arnold's uh, 1947 sighting. And, you know, we know about the uh, reports of airship sightings in the late 19th century and, you know, and, and even uh, cases going much further back. I've, but um, you mentioned radar uh, cases, and, uh, and one of the sort of things I look at in um, in Mirage Men is uh, a system called Palladium, which was developed, uh, I think, through the, from the late 40s and through uh, to the present day. I, I would expect it's still used um, by the CIA and uh, the NSA, and that's a by now very sophisticated technology for. Uh, kind of projecting false radar paints onto um, radar scopes of uh, either on the ground or on um, aircraft, and uh, certainly by the 1960s, they were it was it was uh, developed enough that they could actually change the size of of the radar paint and the uh, speed at which it was flying and the direction with, in which it was flying and. Um, I learned this from reading um, Body of uh, Secrets by uh, James Bantard, a very uh, interesting uh, history of the NSA, and uh, he mentioned drone aircraft with uh, scalable radar signatures being used uh, over Vietnam. So I started sort of looking around for this and, and found that this was something that had first been a, a phenomenon that was first actually uh, reported in 1945 in the uh, Pacific campaign when uh, Navy ships kind of clustered together would start uh, picking up strange uh, radar signals, which they actually ended up attributing to the um, all the sort of different uh, electromagnetic and radar uh, uh, radar emissions being kind of pumped out by all the ships that created um, sort of uh, strange anomalous signals. And over time, the system was refined, and I really think can be uh, seen to be behind a number of uh, sort of radar radar cases uh, on the record. Of, okay, but um, there was one big it. case here which, you know, is still considered mysterious and we'll have to ask more about it in our next section. Washington National Airport, 1952, mm -hmm. the summer of 52. And some suggested it was temperature inversions and Major Kehoe, assuming he was not part of the government conspiracy, made a big to-do about the fact that this couldn't be, it had to be something that was real, it had to be evidence of something strange, something unusual, and we'll have to explore that in the next section. We have Mark Pilkington, the book, hardcover, is Mirage Men, an adventure into paranoia, espionage, psychological warfare on UFOs, and even if you believe UFOs, I'm sure, neighbors, you want to find out about the stuff that's fake about the stuff that's some kind of military disinformation operation so you can check out the real stuff. The co-host is Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in... The Paracast. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. 
One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. If you're a regular listener of this station, then disaster survival is vitally important to you and your family. Long-term food storage, water filtration, emergency food preparation, and quality survival products are not just talk topics, but a way of life. We strongly believe in being prepared for any emergency. We are foodandwaterstore.com, owned and operated by people who are into emergency preparedness. And because we are preppers like you, we own and use the products we offer. You'll find quality name brand proven products like Global Sun Ovens, Wonder Mill Flour Mills, Mountain House foods, Seychelles and Berkey water filters, and many more, plus videos and articles at foodandwaterstore.com. 90% of our customers are return customers because of our low prices and excellent customer service. We still believe the customer is always right. Discover what your family needs to weather any storm at foodandwaterstore.com or call 1-877-773-7123. Foodandwaterstore.com, helping you prepare for the storms of life. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over five years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light System today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $209, and the Berkey guy will include three sport Berkey water bottles and ship everything to you free of charge. That's right, three sport Berkey water bottles and free shipping. An $87 value, yours free. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653. Or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. Hi, this is Alex Jones. Did you know that the global elite are now storing non-hybrid seeds in secret storage vaults near the Arctic Circle? Did you know that in a real meltdown, non-hybrid seeds can become more valuable than silver or gold? It's true, seeds have outperformed even gold and silver before in this country, and it's possible that could even happen again. So our friends at Solutions from Science have put together the perfect mix of non-hybrid seeds. They call it a survival seed bank, and it can produce an endless supply of nutrient-dense food for you and your family. And here's the best part. These seeds have not been genetically modified in any way, and you actually get enough seeds to plant a full acre crisis garden. So visit them today at survivalseedbank.com. That's survivalseedbank.com. Or give them a call at 877-327-0365. That's 877-327-0365. Remember, in a real crisis, non-hybrid seeds are the ultimate barter item. This is Alex Jones for survivalseedbank.com. Tired of searching for great talk radio? Search no more. I just want to hear more of it. We are the GCN Radio Network. Genesis, Genesis. You've entered another dimension. You've entered the Paracast. You return with Mark Pilkington. It's Mirage Men is the book, and Nick Redfern is the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Powercast. So the question on the table, 1952, was that temperature inversions at Washington National Airport? Well, I I, I think this is really um, one of the most, absolutely the most uh, critical UFO incidents on the record because it's the one that really... uh, so firstly, I think, drew the CIA into the story and just made, was, was an example of, the, of the, the greatest fear that anyone could have surrounding the UFO phenomenon, which is that it could 
you know, the, it could uh, infiltrate uh, your airspace right over your capital city. You know, nobody would be able to do a thing about it. And this was, of course, something that uh, would have sent the sort of pulses and temperatures rising all through the uh, through the military and intelligence uh, communities. But um, actually, again, going back to Leon Davidson, he was actually the first to suggest the idea that the two nights of UFO activity in July 1952 over Washington, uh, D.C., were actually um, games being played using an early version of this uh, radar spoofing system that would be, become known as Palladium. And there's sort of too much information uh, to go into in, in this uh, segment, but there are a lot of pieces of circumstantial evidence that would point to some kind of deliberate deception. Um, for one thing, the uh, interceptors that were sent up to investigate the radar sightings had been moved uh, just before to an airport further away from uh, Washington, D.C. National Airport. Um, Edward Rupert, the head of Blue Book, talks about how someone from an unnamed agency, and we can I would guess that that might have been the CIA or the NSA had warned him that there was going to be a, a large UFO incident over Washington, D.C. or New York within a week, and it, and it happened as described. You have Harry Barnes, the uh, radar operator, discussing, uh, complaining that the objects on his radar seem to be listening in on his conversations and particularly with the interceptors sent up to track the objects and seem to respond to any information he gave them. And when the aircraft went up to find them, the radar, sort of, the radar objects blipped out and then uh, returned as soon as the aircraft had returned to base. You have uh, perhaps one of the most interesting sort of pieces of, of circumstantial evidence is that James Sanford, uh, sorry, John Sanford, who was the uh, intelligence, Air Force Intelligence General, uh, who basically supervised the kind of press relations and public relations after the incident. And in fact, they had the largest uh, press conference in uh, the Air Force's history since and uh, the largest sort of military conference since uh, World War II around this subject. He uh, would go on to become the second ever head of the National Security Agency just four years after this incident, which was, uh, and, the, and the National Security Agency itself was, was established just a few months after the Washington overflights, and it's, is it a coincidence, I don't know, that, that uh, the Palladium system, this radar spoofing system, was uh, primarily, or was largely used by the uh, NSA from, you know, from the late 50s on. So it's a certainly, there's, there's a, there are various other Piece, tidbits of information that would suggest something very fishy was going on there. And, and the question, of course, is motivation, and that's uh, something we can't uh, gather from. Seems uh, like a lot of effort, a lot of expense to go through all this nonsense just to fake UFO cases, because if anything, that's being used as a linchpin to advance the case for UFO reality. That and other cases involving simultaneous yeah. radar and visual sightings, and if they're all going to be blamed on palladium, on this device to fake radar images, you know, it gets to be a little bit of a stretch, don't you think? Uh, yes, I hear, you, I hear exactly what you're saying. And uh, I think it's the timing of the... Uh, of this, I, I think this is why I think it's important to reiterate that I don't believe there's a kind of continuous program to generate UFO stories. I think it's just something that, step, you know, that steps in every now and again when it's when it's expedient to uh, to do so but if you look at the timing of the uh, of the Washington overflight um, I really think it seems to follow a pattern of promotion of the idea that flying saucers as they were at the time were from outer space and if you look at the a huge uh, life magazine article that had come out that previous April so just a few months before that was allegedly came from the you know mouth of, of senior Air Force figures themselves that flying saucers were indeed from outer space, which was a real about turn for the Air Force, who'd spent a lot of time trying to quash this notion. And, you, and you know, we can speculate about why this might have been, but I think it's interesting uh, to, to note that around this time, so summer 1952, 
uh, was really the very, very first dramatic escalation of Cold, Cold War tensions as the, you know, the Korean War was um, was 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 running, and um, th- there were real concerns that uh, certainly in uh, in the uh, British intelligence establishment that this could become a flashpoint that would would result in the dropping of uh, more atomic bombs. So, you know, this was a, a very very tense time, and I don't know if. Uh, this, the Washington oversight may have been intended to just demonstrate uh, how easily this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of false uh, false flag operation could uh, could be conducted over over American airspace, or it could have been deliberately designed to uh, draw the attention of the CIA and get them involved in UFO investigations, which to some extent it, it, it succeeded in doing. So. We we can only speculate, but I think um, what we see is a real as a sort of two tier system for both promoting and um, and sort of dissuading and and sort of and, and uh, denigrating the UFO uh, story. So I think, and this I, I would suggest is a sort of continue the process that continues where you have on one level um, the people who are sort of already deeply immersed and ingrained in the UFO culture who. You know, you can't. There's, as I'm sure we're all aware, you can't sort of, uh, you can't convince people who want to believe in something strongly enough that their beliefs are uh, mistaken or misguided. So I think those are the ones they just will keep encouraging and, and uh, sort of feeding more UFO information. At the same time, there's always obviously been an attempt to dissuade uh, other people from getting involved in the UFO subject, particularly say people. In the uh, who are already involved with sensitive technologies or or the intelligence or or within the intelligence or military uh, spheres. So I don't know. My, that would be my suggestion that there is this sort of two-tier operation at work. Well, unfortunately, in the next minute, we can't prove it one way or the other. But certainly, there's a compelling story to be voiced there and expressed. The book is called Mirage Men by Mark Pilkington. The subtitle, An Adventure into Paranoia, Espionage, Psychological Warfare, and UFOs. Whether or not you believe in UFOs, certainly there's a lot of disinformation around. Mark, is there any place, a site that we can check out more of the things you do? Uh, yes, I have, I've actually set up a blog uh, specifically to discuss bits of issues and news related to Mirage Men, that's miragemen.wordpress.com. And I've been, uh, there's quite, uh, if I say for myself, there's a lot of really interesting information up there. And I would, uh, my plan is to actually start putting up some of the material that I ended up uh, excising from the book for various reasons, mainly for reasons of length. I ended up cutting about 40,000 words of, of some interesting material. Unfortunately, we have to cut this short because we're just about out of time. Nick Redfern, where do we find more of your stuff? Uh, NickRedfern.com, an easy one to remember. Easy to remember. I'm Gene Steinberg. This is the Paracast. A special thank you to our co-host Nick Redfern and author Mark Pilkington for joining us this week on the Paracast. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Nick. Thank, thanks for uh, your contributions about the uh, uh, Andalucci, and that's uh, really interesting. We'll never get to the bottom of that. No, no. I, 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 I love the fact that he was a uh, young favourite uh, contactee, and he yeah. was uh, something of a certainly no friend of the communist. A reminder that Nick Redfern returns next week as a guest with Chris O'Brien as the co-host. Nick will be talking about his new book, Final Events. Paracast is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in the Paracast. Paracast.